Hello everyone, Xeno What If here. Bring in Season 2 Part 5 of What If The Transformers Were In My Hero Academia. Link in the description of the fanfiction of this What If. A. N. Listen here YouTube. I do not own anything and this is not a scam. Chapter 9. After the battle. Comma dot dot. As the ground bridge activated back at Outpost Omega 1, May and Red Alert stood in front of the portal, watching it in anticipation for whoever would be coming through. Agent Fowler had also arrived several minutes ago, though he stood off to the side with his arms folded patiently. Before long, though, the first of their allies to return came through, with Izuku leading the way with his classmates by his side. May's eyes brightened up and a gasp escaped her throat, the inventor immediately rushing up the steps to meet them on the platform. Haha, you guys made it back. She zipped right up and slung an arm around Momo and Kyoka's shoulders. And you aren't mincemeat. This is fantastic. All of the teens visibly cringed at that, with nervous smiles across their faces. Uh, gee, thanks May. Ochako chuckled awkwardly. Are any of you injured? Red Alert asked as he took a scan of them. It didn't take him long to find something that was out of place. Hem, Izuku, your finger. Oh oh, yeah, that's right. Izuku muttered. Kyoka whipped her head around and gave him an incredulous stare. What do you mean, that's right? Dude, how can you forget that you broke your freaking finger? With his good hand, Izuku scratched his head sheepishly. Hee hee, w well, we were so caught up in the Decepticon attack, I I guess it just slipped my mind. Kyoka sighed and shook her head. Izuku, what the heck are we going to do with you? Just then, both Marissa Fairborn and Jacob Burns came walking through as well, and it was then that Kyoka remembered, hey, Marissa, you've got a healing quirk, right? She jabbed her thumb over to Izuku. Think you could heal Celery Stick's finger over here. Yo, Izuku, did you break it again? Marissa asked sternly, only for Izuku to shy away a bit. The medic sighed and shook her head. You know, you can't keep relying on me or the nurse at UA to keep healing you every time you break your bones. Come here. S sorry. Izuku apologized as he showed her his finger, allowing her to start using her quirk on it. I just wanted to make sure that Frenzy was taken care of. That caught Red Alert's attention. Wait, Frenzy. Then that would mean. Burns. Fairborn. The two Sector 7 agents stood at attention, or as best of an attention as Marissa could do with her still healing Izuku's finger. They saw Fowler come storming up the steps, and he wore a look that didn't seem all too pleased. What in the name of Bunker Hill happened out there? I lost contact with your chopper 10 minutes ago. Burns addressed Fowler with a salute. Our apologies, sir, but the chopper was taken down by a Decepticon, while we were in it. Windblade managed to save us, though, sir. Hmm, is that right? Fowler pointed to Burns with a furrowed brow. That was an expensive piece of equipment, Agent Burns. Hope you know how much it costs. Ha. Huh. Oh yeah, hey Fowler. Kyoka spoke up, getting his attention. I wouldn't be too concerned about the cost of your bird if I were you. I'd be more concerned about the fact that your boy Burns over here arrived on the scene and practically gave it to the enemy. H hey. Burns shouted indignantly. That's not. But Fowler raised a hand. At ease, Burns. He faced the kids again and raised a brow. What exactly do you mean by, he handed it to them. Tenya suddenly raised his hand, explaining the situation with his usual stiff movements. To put it simply, Agent Fowler, once the Decepticon saw your helicopter arrive on the scene, she saw it fit to scan the aircraft and take on its form as her own disguise. He gestured over to Agent Burns, who had his lips pursed in frustration. As such, I think it would have been prudent to have had your operatives formulate a better plan than simply issuing an ultimatum to the Decepticons right off the bat. You what? Fowler whipped around and stuck a finger in Burns' face. Burns, you know better than to issue ultimatums like that to an enemy that dangerous. It was at that time that All Might had stepped through the portal as well, which led Fowler to use him as an example. What if All Might hadn't arrived in time, huh? What then? Recoiling a bit, All Might's grin became a bit timid as he scratched his cheek. Um, pardon me, but, what are we talking about here? Ah, uh, nothing much, Kyoka said with a toothy smirk. Just watching someone's ass getting grilled for screwing up, hee hee. Off to the side, Izuku couldn't help but blush. 
Not at Kyoka's comment specifically, but at the mirth in her voice as she said it, along with the way she smiled victoriously. Sure, the reason for it was because she ratted someone out, but he had to admit that what Burns did was kind of bullheaded, so he couldn't blame her for that. Still, the way she smiled, the joy in her voice and the intensity in her violet eyes, it was almost too much for him. Izuku, you alright. The greenette was stirred from his thoughts as Marissa smiled down at him, and something told him that she knew exactly what was going on. Something caught your eye again. She winked. Ah, uh, Izuku faced away from her, sweating profusely. I I I don't know what you're talking about, M. Marissa. Ha ha. Kidding, kidding. Marissa waved off before letting go of Izuku's hand, its finger now fully healed. There ya go, all better. Izuku collected himself and raised his hand up. Ha, ah, gee, thanks Marissa. I, flop Izuku stared blankly as his healed pointer finger fell limp, before eventually losing all feeling in it altogether. Oh, why yeah, that's right. Your quirk heals, but it also makes body parts go numb for a while afterward. Yep, give it about a minute or so and the feeling should be back. Marissa assured. Just then, the Autobots began to make their way through the portal and into the base proper, or at least, a few of them. Bumblebee, Bulkhead and RC came strolling through first while Optimus Prime slowly brought up the rear. The Autobot leader appeared to be visibly quite tired, which Agent Fowler noticed right off the bat. Prime, what happened out there? You look like you were on the bad end of a beating. Optimus sighed and put a hand to his forehead. No need to concern yourself, Agent Fowler. I am, er, before the Prime could finish, though, Red Alert came walking up onto the platform, the medic quite visibly perturbed. The moment Red Alert came to a halt in front of him, Optimus began searching for the right words to say, um, I can explain. Lift. Now, Red Alert sternly pointed over to the nearby truck lift, which had been repurposed into a medical bed for the Autobots. Prime's shoulders sagged a bit and he nodded. Of course. As Optimus and Red Alert made their way over to the lift, Agent Fowler raised an eyebrow over to the other Autobots. Would someone mind explaining to me just what the heck is going on with Prime? RC glanced over and watched as Optimus laid himself out on the left, while Red Alert began setting up a machine with several tubes attached to it. Well, turns out Optimus might not be as healthy as we thought. See, when a bot's in stasis, they rely on conserving their own energon reserves to stay alive. Bulkhead explained. But, if left in stasis for too long, that energon begins to lose its power. It's why we gotta keep consuming energon, so that we don't lose that power. His optics went back over to the Autobot leader as Red Alert began hooking up several tubes to his body. And given how long Optimus has been out for, it's safe to say that his levels are dangerously low. He could barely hold himself in a fight with Starscream, which usually doesn't happen. RC went on. Momo folded her arms and eyed Agent Fowler. Probably doesn't help that he was kept frozen for a long time, which probably stalled a lot of the energon circulating through his body. Oh hey, problems leading back to Sector 7, what a shock. Kyoka deadpanned. Fowler sighed and placed a hand to his forehead. Okay, could we maybe stop pointing fingers and maybe address the more important factor here? Is Prime gonna be okay? Red Alert craned his head over as he finished installing the last of the tubes into Prime's body. He will be, once I give him a proper infusion. Thankfully I just finished refining the small cache of Energon we found a few days ago into liquid form. He set his gaze down to his leader and shook his head. Still, you really should have told me about this, Optimus. Your internal systems should have been screaming at you that your energy levels were low. My apologies, Red Alert. Optimus sighed again. For some reason, they weren't telling me anything, so I thought the feeling would pass soon after I awoke. Your internal warning systems might have sustained some minor damages as well, then. Red Alert deduced as he stepped over to the machine, placing his hand on a large switch. Once we get done with the infusion, we'll open you up and take a look. Ajiro tilted his head at the large machine. So, will the infusion take long? A about 10 to 15 cycles, at most. Or rather, minutes, in your Earth terminology, the medic assured. It's completely harmless and Optimus can remain conscious throughout the duration. He set his sights back to Optimus and gave him a nod. Whenever you're ready, Optimus. Prime sent a thumbs up back to him. Fire it up, old friend. 
With that, Red flipped the switch and the machine word to life, and before long, the humans and Autobots watched as the bright blue liquid energon went flowing through the clear tubes and into Optimus' legs, arms and chest. They could see his body parts begin to glow as the infusion took place, and Optimus took in a deep breath. Ah, yes, already I'm starting to feel better. Well, that's good to hear. Izuku smiled while Bumblebee gave a happy buzz. What a relief. Ochako agreed, placing a hand to her chest. Denki placed his hands behind his head and spoke up. Yeah, I'm glad that's the case. But uh, if we could go back to the battle, just who the heck was that girl Decepticon anyway? The one who scanned the Sector 7 copter. Oh, that's easy. RC answered, bringing up her arm to project a holographic image of the aforementioned femme. Her name is Swift. Like Barricade, she's a top-ranked lieutenant in the Decepticon ranks, known for her quick wit, her silver tongue, and her sarcastic personality. She pressed a few buttons on the holographic display, showing a full-body shot of Swift along with a few other images. She's a master at seven types of Cybertronian martial arts, including Metalikato, and has a special power that allows her to channel energy into her hands, allowing for powerful blasts. And as you can imagine, she uses this ability effectively in close quarters combat as well. Tenya put a finger to his chin, pondering this information. I see, so it stands to reason that this is a Decepticon that we should stay far away from. Any Decepticon is one you should stay away from. All Might emphasized, unknowingly making a certain pink girl flinch. Though I will commend you on your actions in defeating the small one. You all effectively used your quirks against a dangerous enemy like a true team, but I must still emphasize that you keep away from the bigger cons. We don't want to be taking any unnecessary risks, understood. He received a united, yes sir. From the teens, though it was then that he finally took notice that one of them appeared to be upset. Young Ashido. Eep. Mina flinched and snapped her head up, an anxious feeling overtaking her. Why yes, all might. The symbol of peace extended a hand to her. You seem to be upset about something. You haven't said a word since we got back to the base, after all. May also leaned in over to her fellow pink-haired friend, her usual hyper smile replaced with a concerned frown. Yeah, I noticed that too. Mina, is there something wrong? Mina sucked her lips in apprehensively and tapped her fingers together. W well, you see. Do you want me to break the ice? Bulkhead asked raising a metal brow to his partner. If you can't, that's fine, but either way, this needs to be. And no, thank you, bulkhead, but I'm fine. Mina replied before taking a deep breath and walking over to the truck lift, craning her head up to the prime. Optimus. The Autobot commander could hear the nervousness in her voice, and it was clear that something was very wrong. He craned his head down so that he could see her through the grating on the lift. Yes Mina, what is it that's troubling you? Tears began to brim Mina's eyes and she lowered her head in shame. I I'm sorry, but I broke the promise we made to you. A about not getting involved with Decepticon battles. Her arms hugged around her own body as she let the truth out. I just, I wanted to see an awesome fight, so I hid in Bulkhead's backseat. I, I did try to get out when he transformed, but I couldn't make it and I ended up inside him when he went into battle. I, I I'm so sorry, I really am. Optimus continued to gaze down to Mina as she continued to sob and break down, but briefly, he put his attention to Bulkhead instead. Bulkhead, I assume you've already informed her of the repercussions of such an act. How it affects her own safety. I did. Bulkhead nodded. Hmm, good. Please, bring her up here. Bulkhead was slightly confused, but he did was the Prime asked, scooping Mina up and setting her onto the lift. The pink girl was slightly confused at first, but was even more stunned when Optimus began consoling her, his hand gently rubbing her back. Mina, you were very brave to tell me of your mistake. And for that, I commend you greatly and I forgive you. He saw her eyes widen in surprise. But let this be a lesson to you, a Decepticon battle is to be taken with the utmost seriousness. It is not a game, nor is it something to be taken lightly. Do you understand? Mina blinked her eyes and rubbed away her tears with a sniffle. Why yeah, I do now. Good. Now, can you assure me that you will not be involved with a Decepticon conflict from here on out? A smile reappeared on Mina's face and she gave Optimus a thumbs up. You've got it. And, thank you, Optimus. You are very welcome. 
Prime watched as Mina gave his hand a hug before going back over to Bulkhead, allowing him to bring her back down to solid ground. Well, now that we know for sure that the Decepticons are on Earth, it is time to formulate a plan on how to handle them. Right, with so many Energon caches on Earth, it's only a matter of time before the Decepticons find one of them. RC pointed out. Red Alert raised his hand to the group. By the way, that reminds me, what happened with the Energon cache we detected? The Decepticons didn't find that, did they? Bumblebee shook his head and began speaking with his radio. ZRKT, no way, Jose. ZRTK, we beat the snot out of them, ZRKT, before they found it. He's right, Izuku confirmed. Jazz, Windblade, Sideswipe, Strongarm and Sunstreaker all stayed behind to mine some of it. They should be coming back once they've gathered a good amount. Hmm, I see. Red Alert nodded. If that's the case, though, we should probably establish some sort of guard around the place. If the Decepticons are willing to find and mine Energon caches and they locate that one, we may be at risk of losing one of the bigger sources of Energon we have. Now that, I can take care of. Fowler said as he lifted up his phone. I'll get some of our top Sector 7 agents on the case. Ones with quirks that'll be able to handle the cons should they decide to snoop around there again. He craned his head over to Jacob with a furrowed brow. Agent Burns, you think you can make up for your little stunt today by leading this mission? At that, Burns straightened up and saluted to his superior. Sir, I will not let you down this time, sir. I certainly hope not. Now, what about mining? Can Energon be unearthed by human tools or is there a specific way to get him out of the ground? Optimus raised his head slightly to set his optics onto the agent. Don't worry, Agent Fowler. Any form of excavation equipment will be able to successfully mine Energon. He furrowed his metal brow seriously. However, it is highly recommended that you be careful with it. Energon can be very volatile, and if there is an accident, it could cause a chain reaction that would result in a catastrophic explosion. Fowler nodded and made a note of that on his phone. Got it. I'll get some of our top digging Koric users on it. Izuku's eyes couldn't help but brighten up at that. Whoa, you guys have special operatives who have specific quirks for different situations. That's so amazing. Hmm, well of course. Fowler said proudly. Given the field we're in, we gotta make sure we recruit people with several unique quirks for the job. He pointed to the young Greenette and added, that's the best part about the military, kid. Unlike regular law enforcement, we don't have rules that constrain quirk usage. The police may let the heroes do the heavy lifting when it comes to villains, but when in the heat of battle, you gotta use every asset available, and that includes quirks. Marissa placed her hands on her hips and raised a brow to her superior. That may be true, but at the same time, we don't discriminate when it comes to people who are quirkless either. Everyone, quirk or no quirk is able to enlist. Isn't that right, Agent Fowler? Izuku's eyebrows rose up in surprise, his sights darting between Marissa and a somewhat sheepish Fowler. After a few seconds though, he was able to put two and two together. Wait, so does that mean, Izuku's eyes widened as the revelation hit him. Agent Fowler, you're quirkless. There were a round of surprised gasps from the teens before the symbol of peace gave a hearty laugh. Ah ha ha. Well, cat's out of the bag, E.H. Bill. All Might said as he put a hand on his friend's shoulder. Indeed, young Midoriya, the veteran you see before you is 100% without a quirk. Pretty astonishing, isn't it? HMHM, well, I wouldn't say it's too surprising, All Might. Fowler said as he shrugged off the massive hand. But yep, I'm as quirkless as the day I was born. Man, who would have thought? Denki admitted as he rubbed the back of his neck. I mean, I don't think anyone would imagine such a high-ranked guy like you would be without a quirk. True, a lot of guys at the top do have plenty of flashy quirks that have earned them fame. But that just means I had to work my ass off to get where I am today. Kyoka pursed her lips as she glanced at Izuku and then back to Fowler, seeing the former with a contemplative expression. It seemed like Izuku wanted to ask a question, and she had a pretty good idea what it was. At the same time, though, she knew it would take a lot for him to ask it himself, so she nudged him in the side and whispered, Go on, ask. Izuku gasped and faced her, prompting her to smile at him. It's okay, I'm sure he'll answer. 
Izuku stared into Kyoka's eyes for a few seconds after, a self-assuring feeling beginning to wash over him. He returned her smile before putting his serious expression back on. You um, Agent Fowler. The special agent returned his attention to Izuku, allowing him to continue. I, I, I heard that a lot of quirkless kids get bullied. Were you ever, you know? Was I ever picked on in school for having no quirk? Fowler finished. Oh, hell yeah I was. In fact, people being quirkless was a lot more common in my school than most places. I was raised in Washington DC, and you wouldn't believe the amount of quirkless kids in my class alone. We got bullied to hell and back, but thankfully the teachers weren't tolerant of it. He didn't notice Izuku's small flinch at his words. But with that said, even though the words hurt and the sticks and stones even more, I vowed to show those punks just what I was made of. So right out of high school, I enlisted, and I don't regret it. Momo smiled and clasped her hands together. Wow, that's very inspiring, Agent Fowler. Those hooligans sound utterly deplorable. Tenya exclaimed. I'm sure that you showed them. Fowler scratched his chin and chuckled. Hee hee, well to be honest, I haven't really thought about him in a long time. After I joined the military and earned my stripes, I stopped caring about what they said about me. He pointed at the kids with a serious face. But let me just tell you kids this, making fun of people for not having a quirk is never okay. Ochako furrowed her brow and raised her fists up. Oh, you don't have to tell us that, Agent Fowler. Mina mimicked her while steam billowed from her nostrils and ire. Yeah, no doubt about it. Bullying is never okay, but those kinds of idiots are just the worst. Just you wait. Mina suddenly slammed her fist down on a nearby metal surface, her grin having come back. Though this time, it seemed much more maniacal. At some point, I'm gonna make a baby that'll teach all of those bullies a lesson. The group couldn't help but wear nervous looks at the mad inventor's words, but Fowler took it in stride all the same. Ha, huh, well that's good to know. Though that last part may be taking it a bit too far, I'm glad you all acknowledge that bullying is never a good thing. Out the corner of his eye, Fowler noticed that Izuku's head was hanging low, and it was at that moment he knew that question wasn't just something that came from nowhere. God, kid, I probably should have figured since All Might gave you one for all. I'd better pull him aside soon and have a real talk with him about it, he glanced over to All Might, who had also set his gaze over to his protege. And something tells me I'm not the only one. Hey, ah, uh, so what happens now? Ajiro piped up. We know for sure that the Decepticons are on Earth, so that means they'll probably go after some of the Energon caches too, right? Optimus raised his head up and nodded to the boy. That's correct, Ajiro, and it is quite unfortunate. He laid his head back down and stared up to the ceiling. It means that the war is practically starting all over again, only this time on a planet that is far more fragile than Cybertron. Hey, what do you mean by, fragile, prime? Ajiro raised his fist and hardened it up. Pretty sure All Might just showed us that humanity's a lot tougher than the Decepticons were expecting. But the prime simply shook his head. And I do not doubt that. But what I mean is that the environment of Earth is more fragile. He glanced out the window to see all of the greenery just outside. Rather than the surface being made of metal and clustered with cities, of which can be repaired with the right resources, Earth's natural organic fauna are delicate, and cannot be simply fixed. Prime's got a point. Bulkhead agreed. If the Decepticons were to rain asunder on this world, they'd probably scorch the entire planet so much that it'd take millions of years for things to fix themselves. The green Autobot clenched his hand into a fist. It's now become all the more important for us to keep this planet safe. W well, it could always be worse. Ochako reminded. I mean, didn't Starscream say that Megatron wasn't with them? That's a plus, right? RC gave a small sigh. Well, that does seem to be the case, for now at least. She folded her arms in apprehension. But still, we shouldn't count out a sudden arrival from Megatron just yet. After this encounter, I have no doubt that Starscream will report it in. ZRKT, do you remember, ZKRT, who you're talking about? Bumblebee pointed out through his radio. ZKRT, Star, ZRKT, Scream, ZRKT, is a bold-faced liar. ZRKT, he's way too proud of himself, ZKRT, to report a single loss to, ZRKT, Megatron. 
Izuku brightened up at his friend's words. Hey, Bumblebee makes a good point. If I had to guess, Starscream probably won't take the loss well. But given how much he said he hates Megatron, there's no way he'd inform him about it this soon, hopefully. I suppose that is all we can hope for, Izuku. Optimus figured before changing the subject. But let's not dwell on this for too long, shall we? After all, we still have your training for the sports festival to think about. The teens all saluted up to Prime and gave a unanimous, right. Before the Autobot leader moved his gaze down to All Might. Which reminds me, All Might. Hem. Yes, what is it, my friend? I wanted to speak to you about Izuku's training. I believe you would like to hear what I have in mind for it given that you are his mentor. All Might beamed up to Optimus, giving a salute of his own. Aha. Uh -huh. Why of course. The fact that you wish to help young Midoriya in his training is greatly appreciated. So once you're up on your feet, we can talk. Thank you, Optimus relaxed himself as the procedure continued, feeling all the more energized with each passing moment. Still, the commander couldn't help put all of his focus on the upcoming conversation, along with revealing a certain fact to the symbol of peace. I hope he takes me knowing about one for all as well as Izuku did. Comma dot dot. The moment Starscream began to stir, his optics snapped open and he thrust himself up off of whatever surface he was laying on, crying out in shock. Gah. W what? Where? How? Who? Clang. Gah. All of a sudden, the air commander was forced back down onto the flat surface, which he just realized was a metal slab, inside of the medical bay of the dark side. He had been sat back down by a duo of vehicons, who were immediately on the receiving end of his glare. What is the meaning of this? How did I get back here? Now, now, do not move yourself too much, Herr Commander. Starscream grumbled at the sound of Flatline's voice, the Decepticon medic strolling into view with a data pad in his hand. You took quite Z blow to Z cranium down Z ear. Wound your vitals are through Z roof. The doctor tapped his chin as he went over the data again. But, Jen again, it could always just be your normal vitals. Given how frustrated you are, I wouldn't be surprised. Starscream sneered and pushed the vehicons away, removing some of the wires that were attached to him as well. I think you'll find that I am quite well, doctor. Flatline gave a small chuckle. HM HM, that's not what Swift thinks. She believes that you should stay within Z medical bay for a few decacycles and gen maybe. He was cut off when he heard the sound of Starscream's null ray powering up near his audio receptor, leading him to slowly turn his head to see Starscream aiming at point-blank range. Ah, uh, hee hee, be but if you wish to leave whenever you like, that is also an option, hee hee. Thank you, good doctor. Starscream lowered his weapon and narrowed his optics as flatline. Now tell me, where exactly is Swift? She is on Z bridge. Flatline said before Starscream immediately headed toward the door. We veer expecting you to be out for some time, so she wanted to wait until you woke up before contacting Lord Megatron. Starscream paused as the doors slid open for him, his fist clenching in frustration. That call will be belated, sorry to say. And with that, he stepped out of the medical bay, leaving Flatline to contemplate exactly what that meant. Oh dear, ZHIS does not look good. Hey, Doc. Flatline's head snapped around to see Frenzy kicking and thrashing against his own bed. Now that the boss is up, ah, uh, the minicon held up his hands which were still trapped in glue, along with his buzzsaw. Ya mind getting me out of this? Through the hallway, Starscream marched his way toward the bridge, a deep scowl lined across his features. No vehicons dared approach him should they incur his unbridled wrath, though that didn't stop a certain larger Decepticon from making his approach. Starscream. The air commander halted at the sound of the familiar bellowing voice of Blastwave, the indomitable oaf stomping his way toward him with a snickering smirk. Makeshift was also standing off to the side, making sure that he was safely out of range. I hear that you were made big fool of by the Autobots and little organic man. Blastwave threw his head back and laughed. Ahahaha. Oh, that slaps me on the knee. Starscream just clenched his fist even harder. Blastwave, I have no time for this. Oh, did little baby screamer soil diaper? Blastwave taunted. Because I smell nothing but the foul odor of shame from you. Ha ha ha. Doe. Wham. Without warning, Starscream suddenly punched Blastwave in the nether regions and, with all his might, 
hefted him up and over his shoulders before slamming him into the floor head first. And, with no other words, Starscream continued his march toward the bridge. I could have told you that it happened. Makeshift spoke up. Blastwave raised a finger and uttered, worth it, before collapsing in a heap. It wasn't long before Starscream finally made it to the bridge, where he saw Swift and Barricade both facing away from him. But the moment he entered, the two turned around and eyed him warily. You sure got up fast. Barricade commented. I'm known to rebound quickly. Starscream waved off as he approached Swift, stopping just inches away from her face. Especially when it involves making plans that I was not aware of. Swift scoffed and shrugged her shoulders. PSSH, not really sure what you're talking about, but by the way you just flipped Blastwave, I get the feeling you're not too happy. She reached up and grasped his pointed chin while speaking in a baby voice, does Sweemy wanna tell me what's the matter? Do not patronize me, Swift. Starscream swiped her hand away before pointing a finger directly at her. Flatline already told me about your plan to contact Megatron as soon as I awoke. But let me tell you, that will not happen. Whoa, 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 first off, I'm willing to take a lot of scrap, but you batting my hand away like that ain't one of them. Swift lit her hand up with green energy again as a snarl took over her lips. And secondly, that wasn't even my plan to begin with. I just relayed the message to the doc and that was that. Starscream's optics narrowed further. Really? Well if you were just doing that, then that leaves only one candidate who could have given that order. Swift deadpanned and placed her hands on her hips. Gee, how long did it take you to figure that out, boss? Right at that moment, the bridge doors opened again, and a certain shadowy figure with a glowing red visor entered the room. Oh hey, speak of the devil. Starscream growled and whirled around, facing Unacronus head on. Ha, huh, good, you're awake. Didn't take too long at all. The general folded his arms, a small smirk being seen within the shadows. I'm guessing that Earth wasn't gonna be as much of an oil cake walk as your first thought, E.H. Starscream. Silence, fool. Starscream dismissed immediately. I was simply taken off guard, is all. You underestimated the symbol of peace's power. Unacronus corrected. I guarantee that there's a reason he got that name in the first place, and, I'm guessing it's not because he's the weakest hero on this planet. He tilted his head as he watched Starscream fume, quite literally as puffs of steam began coming out of his head. Now, now, ya don't wanna overheat your processor, do ya? Let's just calm down for a second, see if Lord Megatron's willing to spare a few. No. Nearly everyone in the room was taken aback by Starscream's the sudden outburst, though the only one who didn't flinch was Unacronus himself. The general instead tilted his head, leading Starscream to collect himself and clear his throat. Er, um, I mean, no, that will not be necessary. He turned his back to Unacronus and stepped further onto the bridge, gazing out into the starry abyss of space. After all, this was only but one loss to the Autobots. A single mishap needn't require us to immediately send for backup. In his mind, Starscream added, especially via Megatron. Barricade decided to jump in. Okay, so what do we do now then? The Seeker hummed in contemplation before inspiration struck him. Oh, oh ho ho, wait, that's it. He began typing in commands on the primary control panel and a holographic map of Earth's globe came up, focusing in on Japan. It's very simple, really. He pointed up to Japan, highlighting it in red. We know that the Autobots are on this island nation. As such, it would stand to reason that they must also be based there as well. He balled his fist in determination. So, I say it should be a priority to find this base and destroy it by any means necessary. Swift pursed her lips and nodded, impressed with her commander's thinking. He makes a good point. Besides, those islands are pretty tiny, so finding them should be a piece of oil cake. You think so, hem? Unacronus said skeptically. All right, I'll admit, that is a decent plan. But you forget one thing, Starscream, our energon reserves are already low as it is. If we wanna stand a chance against the Autobots, we're gonna need to find at least a decent cache to keep our crew up to snuff. HMPH, a simple task that even a protoform can accomplish. Starscream balked. Computer, run a scan of the planet for any and all energon deposits. The Darkseid's computer did exactly as it was told, and within a few minutes, the words, scan completed, flashed across the screen. 
Hmm, yes, very timely. Now, show all deposits on the global map. There's bound to be at least a some energon he, he, here. Starscream felt his jaw go limp, hearing the sound of his gasping subordinates and unacronis behind him. For on the holographic global map, there were now several blue dots lining across every inch of land, and even a few in the oceans as well. It seemed that no matter where they looked, there was just another place where energon deposits seemed to be. By Tryon's beard, Barricade whispered. Sweet Solus Prime, that's a L-O-O-O-O-T of Energon. Swift agreed. An insidious smirk worked its way to Unacronus' face. Hey, well no wonder the Autobots are here. If the Ark really did crash on this planet, it would make sense why since the place is practically littered with Energon deposits. He craned his head over to Starscream and gave him a nod. Well, take your pick, Commander. Which one should we go to first? Well you don't have to be condescending about it, you know. Starscream snapped before noticing something. There were definitely a few deposits in Japan, to be sure, but at the same time, there was a specific one toward the western half of the nation that had caught his eye. Wait, you must be joking. Huh, what is it? Barricade asked. Starscream thrust his hand up and pointed to the cache he found. This deposit, it's in the very same exact location where we fought the Autobots. Both hands flew up to his helm as the realization hit him. Scrap, that must be why Prime and the Scout were even there in the first place. Gah, I cannot believe this. Swift raised her hand. Well, I can. If you had just decided not to shoot first and lay on your usual shtick when you got there, maybe you would have got the chance to ask just why they were in that cave. The Seeker pinched the bridge of his nose and grumbled in frustration. Ah, gee gah, whatever. The past is in the past. He glowered at the globe and continued. No doubt the Autobots and their allies must be setting up defenses around that area so they can safely mine that deposit. In which case, Starscream spun the holographic globe until it he saw a land mass that made his optics widen, until his smirk returned once more. It may have been on the opposite side of the globe from the Autobots, but with the number of huge deposits, it was too good to resist. Oh, this will do nicely. Decepticons, we are headed to, err, to, he pressed a button on the console again. Computer, what is the name of this place? Canada, Commander. Yes. Decepticons, set a course to, Canada. Ahahaha. Comma dot dot. It had been about half an hour since the humans and Autobots had returned to base, and in that time, Windblade and the other half of the team had returned with about as much energon as they could carry in their arms. Which, as it turned out, was actually quite a bit. The teens had all marveled at the huge, glowing crystals as the away team set them down in the base, with Windblade saying, well, it's a start, but there's still plenty more where that came from. Item of note, it's crucial that on any future mining projects, we bring carts with us. Strongarm suggested, it'd make things a lot easier, she glared at Sideswipe out the corner of her optic. And far less annoying. Oh, I'm sorry. Sideswipe snapped back sarcastically as he pulled out his jackhammers. But as the bot who did most of the digging, how wouldn't I find it annoying to have to carry a lot of it back? Ah, come on Sideswipe, it builds character. Jazz assured, patting the large crystal that he had carried back himself. And it helps build discipline, too. Sideswipe deadpanned and rolled his optics. Thanks, but I think I get enough of that from just hearing Strongarm prattle on about protocol all day. He smiled in satisfaction when he heard Strongarm growl at him before shifting his gaze over to his brother. Ain't that right, bro, bro. He scanned the area before finding Sunstreaker, and in hindsight, he probably should have seen this coming. Oh, yeah, of course. The yellow bot had sat down on a bench in front of a large mirror and shifted his hand for his buffer, going right to work on getting the scratches out of his paint. Don't you worry, old friend. I'll have ya spick and span by the time we're done here. Sunstreaker hummed a happy tune as he began buffing himself, much to everyone's chagrin. Okay, I like Sunstreaker and all, but why does he treat his paint job like his baby? Denki asked. Well, let's just say that Sunny used to be a pretty famous model back on Cybertron. Sideswipe explained. Always sporting the shiniest new rims or the latest model engine. And he always wanted to look his best for his fans, and the femmes. That last part made Sunstreaker flinch, which Sideswipe was hoping for. So, 
He's made sure to keep his paint up to snuff. He rolled his optics and scoffed. Though if you ask me, it hasn't gotten him very far. Sunstreaker picked up on that immediately, though. Oh, really? And I'm sure your street racing attracted all the femmes, huh? Strongarm snickered off to the side. Oh, you bet. I'm sure they were all swooning every time I cuffed you and hauled you off to the precinct. Sideswipe narrowed his optics at the duo, but his scowl was replaced with a victorious grin mere moments later. Well, I might have gotten arrested a few times. Several times. But I can at least be assured of one thing, I did get one femme to chase after me. PFF. Ha. Huh. Yeah sure. Strongarm scoffed. And who exactly was the poor unfortunate? The cadet cut herself off when she noticed the smirk sideswipe was giving her, and it didn't take long for her to add things up. I'm going to kill you. Sunstreaker, hold me back. Doing as he was told, Sunstreaker leapt up and put Strongarm in a fell Nelson as she scrambled toward Sideswipe, his brother doubled over and laughing at her all the while. Sunstreaker glowered at Sideswipe, unimpressed. Are you ever going to grow up? As long as it still annoys the crude oil out of Strongarm, probably not. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. Sideswipe transformed into vehicle mode and zoomed away, taking off out of the base entirely. I'm going for a drive now, catch ya later. Sideswipe. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. Strongarm transformed and her siren immediately began blaring, all while Sunstreaker was violently thrown to the floor. You won't be getting away from me. Strongarm, wait. Tenya hollered. You're only... Screech. However, his words were left on deaf audio receptors as Strongarm peeled out of the base, taking off after Sideswipe, proving him right. Ajiro facepalmed and grumbled in frustration. I swear, sometimes I think those two are practically made for arguing with each other. It was then, though, that the spiky redhead noticed that Ochako, Momo and Mina were all smiling after the two Autobots, leaving him confused. Ah, girls. Everything okay. Oh yeah, way more than okay. Ochako winked. We're just looking at this from a different point of view, hee <laughs> hee. Mina giggled. Ajiro blinked confusedly at their words. I'm afraid I don't follow. Momo giggled a little as well before raising a single finger to her classmate. You know, Kirishima, sometimes when a boy really likes a girl, they relentlessly pick on them just to get their attention. The creation quirk user set her gaze back outside to where Sideswipe and Strongarm left. And a part of me can't help but feel like that's exactly what we're seeing here with those two. Ochako and Mina were quick to nod in agreement. At this point, it wasn't just Ajiro who was giving them an incredulous stare. Kyoka, Denki, Tenya, and even the rest of the Autobots all joined in as well. They honestly couldn't believe that the trio had managed to reach that conclusion. Ya yeah, know, I think if either Sideswipe or Strongarm had heard that, they'd show you guys no mercy. Kyoka piped up. Yeah, gotta agree with her on this one, ladies. Jazz agreed. Ain't no way Sideswipe and Strongarm have a thing for each other. And if that somehow happens, I think the universe will just end. Windblade added. The city speaker began scanning around the area, searching for any sign of her leader, but to no avail. Ah. Uh, by the way, where's Optimus? I expected him to try and at least break that fight up. Jazz crossed his arms and tilted his head. Hey, yeah, and, where's B? Oh, they and Midoriya went off somewhere in the base to talk to All Might. Denki answered. Something about the training he's getting to help use his quirk and all that. The blonde glanced down the nearby hallway, where the aforementioned quartet had gone down. Wonder how all that's going. Comma dot dot. All right. I think this room is about as private as we're going to get. All Might said as he and the others entered the Autobot's new training room, closing the door behind him. He was honestly still a bit taken off guard that Optimus had wanted to speak with him personally about Izuku's training, but then again, he wasn't too surprised either. After all, it was likely that the Prime had caught on to the fact that he and Izuku had similar quirks, and wanted to compare how he had trained Izuku to compare how his training regimen would go. I must still be careful, though. All Might noted in his head. I must not let him catch on about one for all. The symbol of peace saluted up to Optimus with his signature grin. 
So, Optimus, what is it that you wanted to discuss about young Midoriya's training? Optimus faced down to All Might as Izuku and Bumblebee watched on, the Quirk Inheritor visibly nervous as he had an idea of what would happen next. Well, All Might, there is, something that I wanted to make clear with you before we start. Why of course, fire away, I know about one for all. Hawk, the moment Optimus said that, All Might was shocked to his very core. So much so that he started hacking up blood into his hand while Izuku and Bumblebee ran over to him in concern. Optimus immediately lowered himself down as well. Hey All Might, are you alright? All Might coughed a few more times as his eyes widened, still in disbelief of what he heard. You, you what? I, I managed to connect the points fairly easy. Optimus admitted. I noticed that Izuku's quirk wasn't exactly suited to his own body, and that the force of his power contained the exact same type of energy that yours did back when we fought Shatter and Dropkick. Optimus raised a hand to the pro hero. Also, I don't want you to get the idea that Izuku himself told me, because he didn't. He was just as surprised as you are now when I told him I knew. Though admittedly, he didn't cough up his internal fluids. Hawk Hawk. Erg, yes, please forgive me for that. All Might pleaded, wiping what remaining blood was on his face. Unfortunately, it's a result of a rather gruesome injury that I sustained long ago. Is that steam also a side effect of the injury? All Might's eyes widened and he glanced down to his body, which was indeed beginning to steam up once again. Oh no. Izuku reached up and placed a hand onto All Might's arm, trying to reassure the man. You um, All Might, considering that Optimus already knows about one for all. Maybe he should know about this, too. Hawk Hawk. You're, you're right, young Midoriya. With a heavy sigh and his shoulders slumped, All Might nodded his head. It's probably for the best that Optimus be led into this fold completely. He craned his head back up to look Optimus right in his optics as the steam began to overtake him. Be warned, my friend. What you're about to see, isn't pretty. Optimus immediately took notice in All Might's change in cadence as the steam wafted away, and when he saw the man before him, his optics widened in complete shock. Where the mighty, muscle-bound man with the swept-back blonde hair had once stood, was now an anorexic skeleton of a man with sunken in eyes, thin limbs and a messy mane of blonde hair. However, he still knew that this had to be the same person. All Might. Please, call me Toshinori. The thin man replied as he practically swam in his hero costume. At least in this form, anyway. No one else can know about my condition, so it's best if you call me by my real name while I'm like this. By the Matrix, this injury must have been considerably severe. Oh, you don't know the half of it. Toshinori went to lift up his shirt, revealing the massive scar where the hole in his body once was. It was enough to make Optimus actually gasp. Yeah, like I said, it's not pretty. My whole stomach was destroyed and my lungs were nearly shot, too. Optimus peered closer to the injury, still in disbelief that the man before him was even still alive. How long ago did this happen? About five years ago, Toshinori answered. Got it in a pretty nasty fight with a dangerous villain. He lowered his shirt as he continued. Since then, I've only been able to be All Might for about three hours at a time, though recently, it's gotten shorter. My time as the symbol of peace, is soon going to be coming to an end. The Prime let that fact sink in before nodding to him again. I see, hence why you passed on your quirk to Izuku. Toshinori smiled a skeletal grin, moving his sights over to Izuku, who was still visibly saddened. Yep, I'm training him to be my replacement, the next symbol of peace. He reached up and ruffled Izuku's hair, catching him off guard. He's proven to be a fast learner, and has shown no hesitation in wanting to be the next holder of one for all. I'm quite proud of him. Ah, shucks all might. Izuku rubbed his neck sheepishly. I know, I know, kinda mushy, but it's true, young Midoriya. Toshinori winked with a thumbs up. You've done very well so far, and going forward, I know you'll do even better, he moved his sights back to the prime before him. Especially if you have the help of this guy, right here. Optimus chuckled at that. HM HM, well I certainly hope so. Though I feel that I must tell you that my finding out about One for All wasn't completely by guesswork, and it has to do with why I specifically wish to help train Izuku, Prime reached around and opened his chest panel, which once again enveloped Bumblebee, Izuku and Toshinori in a brilliant blue light. 
The symbol of peace was taken aback by the object that Optimus pulled out of his chest, namely because he could feel the power radiating from the very center of it. And it felt, somewhat familiar. What, what is that? This, Toshinori, is the legendary matrix of leadership. Wielded by the first prime, Prima, this sacred object has been passed down through the lineage of primes before me, storing and collecting their knowledge and power for the next generation to harness. Optimus explained, lowering the mystical object down to their level. And it is because of the matrix that I wish to help train Izuku, because the power within it is very similar to one for all. Toshinori was left awestruck by the brilliance before him. In fact, it was almost like the crystalline core of the matrix was, calling out to him. He reached up and placed a hand on its outer casing, and immediately, his eyes widened. The hero's vision was taken over by large voice with a shooting beam of energy going from point to point, changing colors with each star it struck. He had visions like these before, so he knew that it was one for all, but rather than ending at the eight point like it usually did for him, it went on to the ninth, before then going on further toward a bright, blue light. It was then that several, multiple voices began speaking all at once in his mind, which made the symbol of peace gasp and recoil in shock. All might. Izuku went over to him, concerned for his mentor. A are you okay? What happened? With a shaky hand, All Might put his hand to his forehead in shock. I, I I'm not sure. I had a vision about one for all and then, voices. Lots of voices, speaking all at once. He shook off the daze in his head and rose back to his full height, his eyes focused on the matrix as Prime returned it to his chest. I mean, granted, since I took on one for all, I've often had visions like this from time to time, but this was different. It was almost like, like there were multiple conversations going on in my mind, and I couldn't make out any clear one. Optimus put a hand to his chin in thought. I see, I too have had visions from the Matrix in the past. This is an interesting discovery. Toshinori raised a brow at him. You don't think, that the past wielders of both the Matrix and one for all. We're speaking to one another. Optimus finished. That is one possible theory. Off to the side, Bumblebee scratched his helm and piped up. ZRKT, but, ZRKT, Optimus, ZRKT, don't you think that's a bit far-fetched? I've heard plenty of far stranger things in my time, Bumblebee, believe me. Optimus assured, something like that cannot be ruled out. After all, it is through the Matrix that I was told that a similar power to it was somewhere here on Earth. The symbol of peace hummed to himself, scratching his chin in contemplation. I see, well, if the Matrix and One for All are truly that similar, then I suppose there's only one thing to do. He faced Izuku and placed a hand on his shoulder. Young Midoriya, I want you to intently listen and learn all that you can from Optimus. I'm sure that he has millennia of combat experience that he can teach you. Of course, I'll still help wherever I can. But if he can assist in helping you harness one for all, then you should definitely go for it. Izuku smiled and balled his fist with conviction, his mentor's words resonating with him. Of course, All Might. I had no intention of doing otherwise. All Might smiled back at his protege wholeheartedly. Good boy, now make sure to give it your all. It was then, however, that Toshinori noticed his watch, along with the time getting close to 7 o'clock. Oh, geez. It's later than I actually thought. Izuku glanced down and saw the time as well, making him yelp in shock. A-H. Oh my gosh, we've all gotta get home soon. Some of us might miss curfew. Hmm, I see. Optimus nodded. It would seem we still have much to learn about human customs. Very well, we will pick up our training tomorrow. He pointed down to Izuku with a serious gaze. But be warned, Izuku, I will not go easy on you, especially now that I've been fully re-energized. I wouldn't expect you to, Optimus. Izuku said with a raised fist. And can't wait for it. Excellent. But before you all go, there's one more thing I wish to know, his optics shifted back to all might and curiosity. Are there any others who know about your true appearance? Toshinori raised a hand up to the prime. Only a few people, and even fewer know about the truth of my quirk. Principal Nezu and Agent Fowler know about it, along with a few select others. Pretty much all of the UA. Faculty knows about this form, along with some of my top people at my Tokyo agency, and maybe Windblade as well considering she saw me at the USJ last week. Optimus Irages rose at that last part. 
Hmm, well, that's unexpected. I may have to ask her about that. Izuku piped up next. A and there's also Kyoka. She also saw All Might at the USJ, so. You guys talking about me in here or what? Gah. Izuku jumped and spun around when he felt a certain pair of jacks tickling the back of his neck, only to be met with a laughing Kyoka Jiro. The girl was holding her gut as she cracked up, much to Izuku's chagrin. Gee, thanks for giving me a heart attack. Izuku deadpanned. Ha ha ha, I'm sorry. Kyoka reached up and put a hand on Izuku's shoulder, partly for reassurance but also for support. I just couldn't resist. Young Jiro, Toshinori exclaimed. H how long were you standing there? Kyoka raised a brow to the blonde man with a smirk. Just got here, actually. I noticed the time and I had a feeling that Izuku would want to leave before any of us broke curfew. Izuku sighed and shrugged. Ha, huh, well I can't fault you there, Kyoka. Yeah, I think it's about time we get going. He set his sight over to Bumblebee and waved up to him. Hey B, mind giving us a lift home? Bumblebee buzzed in approval and the three began walking over to the exit, where they were intercepted by Agent Fowler coming in as well. Oh oh, hi Agent Fowler. Midoriya, Jiro, Fowler acknowledged. Excellent work today. Takan, down that smaller, con, I mean. The earphone jack user simply shrugged, her smirk ever present. Yeah well, someone had to pick up the slack for Burns' dumb decision making. Fowler rolled his eyes at that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Just don't let it go to your heads, okay. Last thing we need is for another little stunt like the one Miss Ishido pulled today. He received a grimace from her before waving his hand. Now go on, it's late. You should get home soon so you can be ready for school tomorrow. Oh of course, Agent Fowler. Izuku stammered as he led Kyoka away. Will do. Good, oh, and Midoriya, about what you asked me earlier, I... Fowler saw Izuku stop and crane his head around, and while he wanted to bring up the subject now, the worried look in Izuku's eyes made him hesitate. While he did want to talk about it, he now recognized that now wasn't the best time, especially since it was already so late. You know what, let's talk about it another time. It's way too late to get into a topic like. Izuku swallowed in relief, his throat feeling dry from nervousness. Alright, we'll see you later, Agent Fowler. Bye. With that, the duo went off, but he couldn't help but notice the stern glance that Kyoka was giving him at the same time. Why yes. You know you'll have to talk about it at some point, right? Kyoka's question made the greenette let out a nervous breath. Why yeah, I know. It's just, not right now. I don't know if I have enough confidence for that, at least not with other people. The perplet sighed and reached up, slowly grasping Izuku's shoulder in support. Okay. But you know I'm here for you if you want to talk, right? Of course. Izuku answered immediately, his smile returning. Always. Back in the training room, however, Fowler walked up to All Might, giving him a serious stare. Please tell me you know that question wasn't a coincidence, right? You mean that he asked if you were bullied for having no quirk in school? Toshinori replied. Yeah, I've got a feeling that's no coincidence at all. He stared after Izuku and Kyoka as they walked off with Bumblebee, his eyes focusing on his protege in concern. In truth, I've had my suspicions about young Midoriya's middle school life when I met him a year ago. He never told me any big details, nor did I ever get privy to it out of respect. The man lowered his head. But, he seemed like such a meek child back then. The type who you'd typically see get picked on by the bigger kids. Really? Optimus asked. Hmm, you would never know that looking at him now, I'll say that. Toshinori nodded up to him. Well yes. Through our training and making friends with Bumblebee, young Hatsume and young Jiro, his confidence and physical prowess have grown substantially, he trailed off as he saw the aforementioned group turn a corner, disappearing from view. But still, there are things that worry me about his time back at Aldera Junior High, and I think I might have a hunch about what, or who might be the cause of it. Fowler crossed his arms and lowered his head. I see. Well, hopefully he'll remember what I said. I wanna have a conversation with him about it and see if he'll open up to someone who also used to be quirkless, he raised a brow over to All Might. After all, I can only assume he was just like you when you were starting out. Fairly similar, yes, only he hasn't taken to one for all as naturally as I did. All Might emphasized, he's got a lot to learn still. 
though I know he'll do well with the quirk to make it his own. One can only hope. Fowler agreed before setting his sights up to Optimus. Now Prime, there's something I've been wanting to talk to you about, too. Optimus tilted his head slightly, his interest peaked. Yes, Agent Fowler. What is it? I've been having my people track down exactly where they dug up the ground bridge to see if we can crack down on any more Cybertronian stuff that might have gotten left behind, and I think we've got a lead. Fowler couldn't help but smirk at the astonished expressions on Prime and All Might's faces. So, in about a few days, how does a trip to Greece sound? Chapter 10. It's all Greek to me. Comma dot dot. Several days had passed since the Decepticons' initial appearance in Japan, and the Autobots had been on high alert ever since. Of course, they made sure to take the time to help train their new human allies in preparation for the sports festival, but at the same time, they were still focused on finding out where the cons would be next as well. And most of all, they were hoping to find out the location of their ship as well, though unfortunately, their initial attempt had been, unsuccessful. Comma dot dot. Two days ago, South America. Optimus, Strongarm, Sideswipe, Jazz and Windblade were making their way through one of the densest, most humid forests that any of them had set foot in, and to put it lightly. None of them were all that happy about it. For the life of them, they couldn't figure out why in the pit the Decepticons would ever station their base in a place like this, but they pressed forward nonetheless. They kept their weapons drawn, ready for any con that felt lucky enough to ambush them. Strongarm, Optimus spoke up, how much further? Having taken the lead, Strongarm held up the tracking device in her hand, which was closing in on a strong signal. Not much further, sir. According to my tracker, we should be getting close to... Gia, ah, Strongarm spun around and aimed her crossbow up, only to see that it was only sideswipe. The red bot had fallen over after sinking in a rather mucky bog, which only made Strongarm groan and roll her optics. Sideswipe, really, we're trying to be stealthy here. Snapping his head up, Sideswipe glared at the cadet and pointed at her. Hey, you try watching your footing with ground like this. It feels like walking through protomatter. The other Autobots gave him incredulous stares, making Sideswipe cough in his hand. Err, I mean, not that I would know what that feels like, it's just. We get the analogy, Sideswipe. Windblade reached down and pulled Sideswipe out of the muck, using her fans help lift him. Just be a bit more observant and we'll make it through this. Ha, huh, yeah, thanks. Sideswipe said as he wiped the grime off his legs. Betcha Sunstraker's glad he's not here right now. He'd flip out at all this grime. Up ahead, Jazz couldn't help but snicker. Hey, true that. And, let's be glad that Bulkhead didn't come with two, otherwise he'd probably end up where you were. However, right at that moment, the tracker began beeping to life, garnering Strongarm's attention. SSH. Guys, quiet down. We're close. The Autobots all kept their heads and weapons up as they worked their way through the tree line coming closer and closer to its edge before finally stepping out into an opening. Sprawling before them was a large, open field, one with a massive boulder at its very center, and nothing else. No spaceship, nothing that appeared to be a base of some sort, nothing. Naturally, this left the Autobots confused. Ah, uh, Strongarm, you sure that thing ain't busted? Sideswipe asked. W what? No. Strongarm brought the tracker up and pressed a button, reaffirming her stance. The tracker says that the signal's coming from this location. She started forward until she stopped right at the boulder, where the tracker began sounding off very loudly. Aha. Uh -huh. See, I told you. Ah, uh, Strongarm. Windblade piped up. However, the cadet seemed to be ignoring her as she worked her way around the boulder. This massive rock must be a front for some sort of secret underground base. All we have to do is break it open and we'll have barricade and the others in stasis cuffs. Jazz cleared his throat. Ah, yo, Strongarm. Good thing I pack explosives for just such an... Strongarm. Optimus said firmly, finally getting her attention. The Autobot leader reached up and pulled two objects off the boulder. One was a data pad, while the other was the tracer. I believe that this was the tracer you placed on barricade, wasn't it? Strongarm's optics widened and she sprinted up to him, procuring the tracer with a look of frustration. Gah, no, you can't be serious. Sideswipe came up and peered closer to the data pad, noticing that it had something on it. 
Oh hey, this thing's got a message. Hmm, nice try. Next time, find something that sticks. Ha 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 ha. Now go boom. Love, frenzy. Huh, what do you think it means? Right at that moment, though, the data pad's screen changed from blue to red, and a countdown in Cybertronian numbers began rapidly going down. Optimus optics widened and he immediately yanked the pad back from sideswipe. Duck and cover. He tossed it as hard as he could back at the boulder while the other Autobots followed his command, diving straight to the ground. The moment the pad struck the boulder, it exploded in a brilliant display, causing the massive rock to shatter into a million pieces. Once they were sure they were all in one piece, the Autobots rose up, with Strongarm appearing less than pleased. It means we've been played. Comma dot dot. UA. Hi, present. And thus, that mission was a bust, and to make matters even more pressing, they hadn't heard from the Decepticons since that day. To the kids, that might not have been a bad thing, but Optimus and the other Autobots were certainly very concerned. If the Decepticons have gone silent, that cannot mean they're up to anything good, the Prime had concluded. We must be ever vigilant, which is why I will be having RC and Bumblebee remain in proximity of UA for the duration of the day from here on out. To ensure your protection. So, there the 18s were, sitting in class near the end of the day waiting for the final bell to ring. And noticeably to the rest of their classmates, they were exhausted. Mina, Denki and Ochako were both slumped over in their chairs while Tenya's legs wobbled even as he sat, and what's more, Ajiro's arms appeared to be quite sore and almost as red as his hair. Kyoka's jacks were also visibly sore and Momo's complexion was somewhat green, though she at least kept herself composed. The only one who didn't seem too bad was Izuku, though he did have a couple bandages on his face and hands. Finally, the final bell of the day rang, and Mr. Aizawa glanced down at his class. Alright, class is dismissed. Remember, while your training is important, you must also keep up with your school work, so be sure that your hero history report is done by Monday, alright? And keep in mind, Midnight's filling in for Bookworm's history class for the rest of the year after last week's unfortunate incident when the false alarm happened. All of the students awkwardly glanced to one another at that last part. How were we to know he'd get underfoot of every single student in that hallway? Hanta Siro whispered. Point being, she's gonna be a lot tougher on you in that class than Bookworm was, so be sure you do well. The mummified teacher awkwardly picked up his sleeping bag and nodded to the rest of the class before headed out the door. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, sir. The class said respectfully to him as he left. Once he was gone, though, Toru Hagakuri spun around in her seat toward the rest of the class, though her main focus was set on the eight most tired of them all. Okay. I gotta know what's up with you guys. The invisible girl said as her clothes jittered around. Just what the heck have you all been doing and why is it messing you up so badly? In the seat in front of her, Mashirao Ojiro also faced the others, concern written across the tailed young man's face. Yeah guys, I know that we've gotta train, but you all seem to be taking it either to a level beyond where we're at or you're just overdoing it. Kinda seems counterproductive, honestly. Suyu added as she stood up from her seat placing a finger to her chin. I mean, we're all going at it hard, but not this hard. You guys should seriously consider dialing back a bit. H.A. Speak for yourself, frog eyes. Katsuki bolstered as he too stood up, instantly getting the attention of everyone in class, for better or for worse. Whatever kind of training they're doing, I bet it doesn't even compare to the stuff I'm pulling off. He sent his glare toward Izuku, making the quirk inheritor flinch. Especially you, Deku. I've got no idea what kind of training you're doing, but I'll tell ya right now, it's gonna get you nowhere. While Izuku shrunk back, Kyoko was already on the counterattack. Is that right? Well, if you really are doing more intense training than us, then why aren't you covered in injuries, asshat? She reached over and pointed to the Greenette's bandages. After all, if Izuku's getting hurt like this, then you must be too. Bakugo snarled at the remark, but glowered back as he answered, Please, if you think I'm gonna get injured like that loser, then you've got another thing coming. I'm just that damn good. Plus, I'm not some frail nerd. Alright, lines being drawn right there. From the back of the class, Kata stood up and stormed up to Katsuki, her glare meeting his mere inches away from his face. I'm willing to take a lot of things, but calling someone a loser and a frail nerd is out of the question. 
If anything, though, this only made Bakugo grin manically as he raised his hands, which started creating tiny explosions in anticipation. Oh, you wanna go, scale belly. I'd be more than happy to oblige. Crack. The entire class gasped at the sound of a hard whipping noise, all of them spinning their heads around to see none other than Midnight standing in the doorway. She had changed out of her hero costume for the day and instead was in a pair of snug jeans and a white shirt under a navy blue jacket. The only part of her hero attire she currently had out was her flog, which she had struck against the wall. Her blue eyes bore into Katsuki and Keita, making them freeze up. That will be quite enough. I believe the school's rules made it very clear that there's to be no fighting in the classroom. Midnight strode over to the duo, her poise confident and purposeful. I initially came in to wish you luck with your history papers, but to be honest, I believe the two of you might need some extra work to make up for what I just witnessed. What? Both students exclaimed before Kata tried explaining. B but, Miss Midnight, I was trying to stop. Ah uh ah, -uh, I don't want to hear a word about how it happened. Midnight silenced. What I want is a handwritten apology from both of you by tomorrow's class. Is that understood? Or should I inform Principal Nezu about this? Keita and Katsuki glanced at one another irritably, before both decided to just roll with the punches they were given. Yes, Miss Midnight. We understand. Good, now I believe it's time for everyone to head home. The R-rated hero raised her hand and pointed toward Tenya. However, young Iida, I would like you and Yaoyorozu to gather Midoriya, Jiro, Kaminari, Kirishima, and Ishido and meet me outside. I would like to discuss your rather, haggard states at the moment. The 18s all glanced to one another nervously before Tenya swallowed and nodded. Why yes, Miss Midnight. As class rep, I will see to it. As Tenya began gathering them up, the rest of class then left, though not before Izuku saw Bakugo giving him one of the worst glares he had ever given to him. And he had a good idea why, too. Why is it that he always blames M.E. for everything that happens to him? He thought in fear, but also with a bit of respite. Soon after, the group of 18s proceeded outside and gathered at UA's front entry, all of them lining up in a row as Midnight addressed them. She was walking back and forth in front of all of them, taking in their rather sorry dispositions. Now, I don't know what happened back in that classroom. Midnight paused as she saw that Denki was practically asleep on his feet. But I did overhear enough to learn that apparently, crack. Gia. Denki let out a gasp as Midnight cracked her flog in front of his face, waking him up. The answer is 24. The others either deadpanned at the electric blonde, or in Kyoka and Mina's case, snickered to themselves. Midnight shook her head disapprovingly and sighed. You all may be overdoing it with your training. Ochako yawned a bit and scratched the back of her head. Well, I guess you could say that. We have been putting in a lot of effort lately. Momo added, hugging her arms around herself. Midnight placed her hands on her hips and raised a brow. Now, I'm all for you kids giving it your all for the sports festival, but I hardly approve of wrecking your bodies for the sake of it. Just what kind of training have you been doing? Unbeknownst to her, though, Midnight's words caused the teens to shudder, all while vivid memories of yesterday came back to haunt them. Comma dot dot. Come on, Tenya, I wanna see 200 full laps before the sun goes down. Pick. Up. The. Pace. You wanted real combat, Ajiro. Well you got it, so don't back down now. Keep getting harder and maybe you won't be driven into the ground. Let's go, Mina. I've seen Rainmakers burn through an Autobot stronghold faster than what you're doing to that mountain. We gotta get your corrosive strength through the roof. Yo, those jacks of your ain't gonna get jacked overnight, Kyoka. I wanna see that boulder get cracked in one go. Put yo, back into it. Time to turn that chubby tummy into muscle, Ochako. Get buff, cream puff. Eat and create. Eat and create. Come on, Momo, I didn't have Sector 7 bring this snack machine over for nothing. Ahahaha. Dance my denki puppet. Dance. Comma dot dot dot. The kids had quickly found out that auto boot camp wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. As the others all trembled at the memories of their ordeals, however, Izuku didn't seem all that shaken by the experience. Honestly, it was pretty similar to All Might's regimen and how he trained me. At the same time, though, he did feel bad that his friends weren't exactly prepared to go through that type of training, so he spoke up for all of them. Ah, 
Hey, W we kinda found an online training plan and, we've been having a bit of a hard time keeping up with it. Yeah, says you. His classmates all thought pointedly. Midnight hummed to herself, placing a hand thoughtfully to her chin. Hum, I see, this wouldn't happen to be the, all-American dream plan, would it? Izuku's eyes widened considerably at that. W wa, how did you? You wouldn't believe how many kids come across that plan on the internet and try to follow it to the letter. A smirk came to Midnight's face and she licked her lips. Usually it's the second years who try to emulate its success to try and better themselves in areas that they failed in their first year, so I'm quite surprised that a bunch of first years are going through such, um, painful and grueling, exercises. The teen saw a glimmer of excitement in her eye. You all wouldn't happen to be masochistic, would you? NN no. Ajiro shouted, his face heating up. Miss Midnight, you've got it all wrong. Tenya began chopping the air profusely as he shouted at the top of his lungs, Please, Miss Midnight, this is absurd and completely unfounded. We only wish to give our best for the sports festival and that's all. A slight sadness took over Midnight's features and she hung her head a little. Drat, well, there goes that idea. She shook her head and put her smile back on. Well, nevertheless, I suggest that you all should lighten up on your regimen, otherwise you'll all be wiped out on the day of the sports festival and won't be able to do anything. Am I clear? Yes, Miss Midnight. The group echoed. Excellent, now you're all free to, beep beep. Hem, ah. Midnight gasped at the sight of a certain yellow Volkswagen Beetle coming down the street, accompanied by a pink Lotus Elise and a big, green Hummer H2 pickup truck. And behind the wheel of the beetle, she saw the object of her ongoing affection, and it was clear that he had seen her. Oh, you who? Brian. Immediately, Brian, pumped the gas and screeched to a halt near the curb. He was going to back up, but then he remembered that, Sadie, was right behind him and he didn't want to rear-end her. Thus, he had to face the music the moment he saw Midnight come sauntering up to him, putting a noticeable sway in her hips. ZKRT, hello. ZKRT, Midnight. And hello to you, too. Midnight greeted cheekily, making bedroom eyes at the young blonde as she leaned into his open driver's side window. She made absolutely sure that her cleavage could be seen as well, just for that added touch. I haven't seen you in over a week, cutie. She reached up and ran her finger across his jawline. Have you been avoiding me? ZRKT, yes, ZRKT, I mean, no. ZRKT, I mean, ZKRT, perhaps, ZRKT, maybe, I. A giggle escaped Midnight's throat as she leaned in even further, getting right up in Brian's face. Oh, you're such a silly boy. Relax, I'm only teasing, as she got closer, Brian could feel the heat of her breath against his face, which made him tremble much more. And it only got worse when she started tracing her finger along his chest. You're so cute when you're nervous, it turns me right on. By the way, I never did give a proper, thank you, to you for aiding our students in the USJ incident. Maybe I could interest you in a little, something. As this went on, the students all couldn't help but feel their jaws go slack at what was going on. You can't be freaking serious. Denki uttered with tears streaming down his face. How in the heck is Bumblebee of all people getting hit on by midnight? Do you know what I'd give for someone that's smoking hot too, jab. Gia ha. Shut it, Kaminari. Kyoka admonished. Now's not the time to be thirsty. Also, be careful and make sure to call the bots by their human names. The perplet trailed off when she saw RC and Bulkhead's doors open up. Speaking of which. Back with the young scout, he and Midnight's eyes were locked as the R-rated hero's lips were mere centimeters away from his own. Come on, Brian, why don't I take you out on for a night on the town? I could show you some sights that I guarantee you've never seen before. Ah, uh, ahem, excuse me, ma'am. And just like that, snap. The moment was ruined by a single word. Ma'am. Midnight pulled herself out of the window and spun around toward the deep voice, glaring angrily at its owner. I will have you know, sir, that I am not a, ma'am. But the woman's voice was lost as she gazed upon the sheer size of the man before her, suddenly feeling incredibly small in comparison. He was an African-American man and had to be about seven feet tall, his bodybuilder-like form comparable to someone like All Might or Endeavor. He wore a dark green tank top, which only allowed him to show off his rippling muscles even more. 
The man also had on a pair of green and brown camo pants with black combat boots, making him appear all the more imposing along with his thick, black beard and mustache combo and bald head. The large man was taken by surprise at her outburst and immediately apologized. Oh oh, sorry, I didn't mean to offend or anything, really. I, uh, are you okay? Never before in her life was Midnight ever this intimidated while also being turned on as well. Granted, she had a thing for all forms of man, whether they were large and in charge like this specimen before her, or meeker and inexperienced like Brian was. The fact that this man was very apologetic as well was also earning points for her, so there was that. Oh, I'm perfectly fine, Mr. Um. Buck. The man answered. Buck Hudson of the United States military. I'm Brian's legal guardian. The teen saw, Buck, briefly glance over and smirk toward them, which immediately tipped them off. He he, looks like Bulk's finally decided on his own holophore. Mina giggled, and I gotta say, seems like Miss Midnight's already been charmed by him. At this point, I think she's charmed by pretty much any man, Mina. Momo said with an eye roll. Midnight clasped her hands together and smiled up to him. Oh, how splendid. Glad to finally meet someone who's close to Brian. Her tobe came out to lick her lips lustfully again. I must say, you must be quite the capable guardian if you have a military background, Mr. Hudson. Err, well, I. Ahem. Midnight did a double take at the sound of a young, female voice, whirling her head around to see a pink-haired young woman standing off to the side with her hands on her hips. Buck, I don't mean to interrupt, but we kinda need to pick up these kids and get going or else we'll be late for, ya you know, the thing. This piqued Midnight's interest, and not in a good way. Um, excuse me, but we were having a talk here. She strutted up to the young woman and pointed right into her face. So who are you to just come in and say when our conversation is done, Missy? Arcee's holoform wore an irritated expression as she reached up and pulled Midnight's hand away from her. Well, if you must know, my name is Sadie, and I'd rather not have you harassing my friends at the moment when we have somewhere to be. Harassing. Honey, do you not know flirting when you see it? Sadie's face scrunched up and she tilted her head. Flirting. With your body. Just as quickly as she was annoyed, Midnight was now very confused. Um, yes. Girl, have you never flirted with a guy before? Well, er, not exactly, but, wait, why am I even talking about this? Sadie slapped her forehead and whirled around to the teens, ushering them to get into the vehicles. Guys, there's been a change in plans for today's training. We all need to meet up at the grounds to go over what's going to be happening. Oh, are you in charge of their training? Midnight placed her own hands onto her hips with a defiant stare. Well let me tell you something, Sadie, I just got done talking to these children about how they need to tone it back a bit on their training for the sake of their well-being. If they train any harder, they could collapse in the middle of class. The pink-haired young woman shifted her eyes back and forth between Midnight and the teens, seeing that they did seem pretty tired. Sadie pursed her lips while considering the teacher's words. Okay, I do see your point there, all the while, she thought to herself, darn, we should have taken in their stamina compared to ours. Ajiro raised his hand up to Sadie reassuringly. Ah, don't worry about it, Sadie. We're fine, honestly. After all, the harder we train, the better we'll be for the festival, right? But Buck stepped in, shaking his head. Nah, your teacher has the right idea, Ajiro. Maybe it's time we let up a little bit. Honestly, we probably shouldn't have started you off on such an intense regimen. He faced Midnight once more and gave her a nod. We'll make sure that we lighten their load when it comes to training going forward. Good to hear, Midnight said with a smile. Now, I'd hate to keep you all waiting, so you're free to go, just as suddenly, though, Midnight spun around on her heel and bent back over into Bumblebee's window, putting her face extremely close to his holoform once again. And I will be seeing you later, Brian. She gave him a wink and lightly poked his chest. But keep my offer in mind, would you? I think we'd both do well to get to know each other a little better. For some reason that not even she herself could figure out, Sadie's eye began twitching, her irritation growing by the astro second. And while she wasn't a hundred percent sure, she knew that it must have had something to do with Bumblebee's proximity to midnight, and so she had to break it up now. Okay, so why don't we load up and roll out, huh? Sound good to everyone. W wait, hold on. 
Izuku halted. What about Hatsume? We should probably wait for. I've been here, muscles. The group gasped at the sound of Mei's voice, the inventor sticking her head out of Bulkhead's back window irritably. Now would you kindly move things along? We're burning daylight and the others are waiting. How? How did she? Kyoka began asking before shaking her head. It's Mei, don't question it. Let's head out, guys. With that, all 81A students climbed into their own rides, their drivers following suit. Before driving off though, Kyoka sent one final wave to Midnight. We'll see ya tomorrow, Miss Midnight. And thanks for saving our butts from being trained to death. Midnight chuckled at that as she waved back. Think nothing of it. And I can't wait to see your history reports on Monday. She saw her students' faces all suddenly do a 180, their smiles deflating in a matter of moments as the cars all drove off. He he he, bet that will keep them from training so hard. Comma dot dot. Okay, so, did anyone else forget their history reports? Mina's question caught Denki and Ajiro off guard, along with Bulkhead in the driver's seat. The only one who didn't seem to be paying attention was Mei, who was tinkering with a new invention of hers. Ah, Mina, we've had this assignment since Tuesday. Ajiro emphasized, how did you just forget it? Yeah, I mean, I'm usually a slacker and even I remembered it. Denki added. Ajiro deadpanned over to him. Dude, let's be honest, that's only because you wanna please Miss Midnight so badly. I mean, I won't deny it, but at least I'm getting my work done, right? Mina whipped around to him with a desperate gaze. Ah, Kaminari, come on, whose side are you on? You and I are pretty much at the same academic level, but you'll do the work just because a pretty older woman in dominatrix gear motivates you too. Denki put his hands behind his head and smiled in satisfaction. Hey, you'd be surprised what the power of a beautiful woman can make a guy do. I got my report finished yesterday. Ajiro and Mina's jaws dropped simultaneously. Dude, when did you have time? Ajiro ran his hands through his hair in shock. I'm not even done with mine yet and you got yours done in three days with all the training we've been doing. I feel so betrayed. Mina whined with her head low. In the driver's seat, Buck shook his head. I'll never understand the kind of power that physical attraction gives you humans. On Cybertron, the way you're built doesn't factor into romance, at least not as much as most organic life. His concentration focused back onto Mina with a furrowed brow. But Mina, if you knew about this since Tuesday, you really should have worked on it more. I know, I know. Mina brought her legs up to her chest, trying to find some form of comfort. It's just with all the training going on and the Decepticons attacking, it just all slipped my mind. Now I've only got three days to get it done. How am I going to do that? Well, you've been paying attention in class, haven't you? Ah, uh, as best as I can. The pink girl rolled her eyes. But that doesn't exactly come easy to me either. But then, Ajiro smiled as he remembered something. Hey, don't you remember what Midoriya and Yaoyorozu said the other day? About how they'd help us study whenever we'd need it. Just like that, Mina gasped and her smile returned tenfold. Ah, oh my gosh, Ajiro, you're right. I could ask one of them to help me out on my report. I'm sure that they must have gotten theirs done, so they've gotta have some advice to help me out. Bulkhead nodded in approval. Ah, see, now that's where having friends comes in handy. Especially ones who get good grades. Just, make sure you don't copy their work, okay? Even on Cybertron, plagiarism is not a good thing. Ah, Bulkhead, how could you? Mina said with a pout. And here I was thinking you thought of me higher than that. Just making sure my bases are covered, Mina. Bulkhead grinned. As your guardian, not only do I have to protect you, but from that little stunt you pulled a few days ago, I need to keep your head on your shoulders, he raised a knowing brow over to her. Am I right? You win this round. But then, without warning, Eureka. Ah. Everyone in the Hummer jumped in their seats before whipping around toward Mei, the mad inventor wearing one of her manic grins. Hatsume, what the hell was that about? Ajiro exclaimed. Oh, sorry Spikes. Mei's smile didn't falter as she raised up the small machine she had been working on. But I think I finally got my latest, most cutest baby to finally work. The other three teens focused in on said, baby, which was actually a small, spherical machine that had a pair of satellite panels on its sides. 
It had a thruster on its bottom and an antenna sticking out of its top, but its most notable feature was a large lens in its center. Isn't it just adorable? The trio eyed one another before Denki asked the obvious. Ah, I mean, it's cool, but what is it? This is my satellite camera yielding selected positions of yonder. May answered while holding the device up. Otherwise known as, SKYSPY. Really had to stretch for that acronym, didn't ya? Bulkhead deadpanned. Hush, bulkhead. And watch. May pressed a button on the back of the Sky Spy and its panels folded out to the side, all while a burst of energy came out from the thruster. Nothing in terms of combustion, though, more like some sort of, energy waves that allowed it to hover in midair. I got the idea after what happened a few days ago, specifically when you snuck off into that battle, Mina. The pink girl crossed her arms in a huff. Gee, thanks for that. No, no, this is a good thing, trust me. May pushed the Sky Spy around in midair, though the device readjusted itself every time it did. See, with this baby, we can watch Autobot Decepticon battles from far away. Heck, the signal it transmits is so strong, we could even watch missions happening all the way back at base. Bulkhead's eyes shifted back to the group in surprise. Whoa, if that's true, then it must be able to do a ton of other stuff, too. I think you'd better show that to Optimus when you get the chance, May. May gave a thumbs up at that. Oh, you betcha, I bet he's gonna love it. Comma dot dot. Several minutes later, the three Autobots pulled off the road and drove along the hidden path to Outpost Omega-1, with all of them pulling into the base immediately much to the confusion of the teenagers. But the Autobots didn't stop there as they beelined it for the ground bridge control room, where the rest of the team just so happened to be waiting. Though surprisingly, aside from Optimus, Windblade and Red Alert, all of them were in their alternate modes. The teens stepped out of their rides and Izuku raised a curious brow to Optimus. Ah, uh, hey, Optimus. W what's going on here? Yeah, what's everyone doing in vehicle mode? Kyoka questioned. Remember how I said that there's been some changes to today's training? RC piped up. Well, this is it. Optimus nodded at that. Yes, RC is correct. I'm sorry, children, but I'm afraid that we'll have to postpone today's training until further notice. Ah, what? Ochako said sadly. But why? Did something bad happen? Windblade leaned over and shook her head. Quite the opposite actually, Ochako. See, Agent Fowler told us a couple days ago that he and Sector 7 were working to locate the place where their predecessors had found the ground bridge. The city speaker smiled and winked to the girl. And believe it or not, we might actually have something. This made the teens, eyes light up with interest. Whoa, are you serious? May grinned back. That sounds amazing. What did they find? First of all, Red Alert turned toward the large main console and typed in a command, bringing up an image on the large, holographic screen. It appeared to be of a huge, empty cavern, though this place was much more than just that. What you all are seeing right now is a large cavern located in the nation of Greece. And according to Sector 7 this is the ground bridge's origin point, so hopefully we'll be able to find some clues as to how it ended up on Earth there. Ah, oh my gosh, Greece. Momo gasped, beaming in nostalgia. I love Greece. My family and I went there one summer during middle school. It's a lovely country. Tenya nodded over to the raven-haired girl. Hmm, yes, my family actually went once as well, though in my case, it was elementary school. He placed a hand to his chin while inspecting the image further. Well, if that truly is where the ground bridge had been before, could there possibly also be some energy on there as well? Red Alert nodded back affirmably. No, possibly, about it, Tenya. After typing in yet another command, a different image came up on the screen, though this one was much more interesting. You see, Fowler said that he sent two teams to investigate certain points where he suspected the origin point to be, and while they did end up finding it, the other team ended up unearthing this. On the screen was an image of not only a small energon deposit, but a large mural that seemed to depict several people. At least seven men and five women lined up side by side. After staring at the image for a few moments, Izuku pointed up to it with an ear-to-ear -ear grin. Hey, I I think I know what that's depicting. They're the twelve Olympian gods. He began indicating all of the figures one by one. There's Dionysus with the grapevines in his hair, 
A and the woman wielding the bow is Artemis, oh, and there's her bother, Apollo holding the lyre on her left. Hey, Midoriya's right, Momo affirmed as she too began to identify the gods of Olympus. That's Ares, the angry one in armor, and next to him with the owl on her shoulder is his sister, Athena. The crooked man must be Hephaestus and I'm guessing the woman who seems disgusted by him is Aphrodite. Hermes is the one in the air with the wings on his sandals. Tenya picked up from there. And then Demeter standing amongst the plants and crops. His attention was then drawn to the very center of the mural. And there's Hera and Poseidon on either side of their king, Zeus, who's in the middle. However, Tenya's brow furrowed at what he saw Zeus holding. Wait a moment. Hem, what's wrong, Ieda? Izuku asked. Midoriya, Yaoyorozu, have you ever seen Zeus holding a sphere of some kind? The duo's eyes went right to Zeus' hand, and indeed, the Lord of the Sky was shockingly portrayed in the mural as holding something other than his signature lightning bolt. The god had some sort of large ball in his hand, though what it was, neither Momo or Izuku could figure it out. Huh, you're right. Momo put a hand to her chin. Just what is that? That would be the object of our intrigue, Momo. Red Alert answered as he zoomed in on the sphere. Whether the ancient Greeks knew it or not, they painted a Cybertronian artifact into this painting, the Energon Harvester. Denki placed his hands on his hips with a smirk. I'm guessing it's exactly what it says on the tin, right? Indeed. Optimus nodded. The Energon Harvester is a device capable of draining Energon and storing it, though it isn't only able to drain normal Energon crystals. The Prime's metal brow furrowed seriously. It can also drain the Energon from any Cybertronian as well. Meaning in the wrong hands. Ajiro's eyebrows rose up as Optimus' words resounded with everyone. In the wrong hands, it can be a weapon. Exactly, Ajiro. Which is why if the Energon Harvester is anywhere in that vicinity, we must retrieve it before the Decepticons do. With all that said, I believe now is the time to depart. Optimus set his optics over to Red Alert and gave him a nod. You may fire up the ground bridge when ready, Red Alert. Without any hesitation, Red Alert pulled the lever and activated the ground bridge, prompting the rest of the Autobots to start rolling up onto the platform. Off to the side, the group of 1A students and May all stared after them, feeling somewhat bummed out. Well, I hope you guys have fun on your Cybertronic archaeology trip. Kyoka muttered. Sounds like it'll be a lot of fun. Whoa, now hold up, Kyo. Jazz said as he suddenly came to a halt. Just when was it ever stated that we were leaving you guys in the dust? The 19s all did a double take at what he said. Wait, hold on, seriously. Denki smiled hopefully. You'd really take us on a trip to Greece for the afternoon. Well, yeah, Sunstreaker reaffirmed. Think of it as our way of making up for the lack of training today. And the fact that we may have been overdoing it on the training in the first place. Sideswipe admitted. Strongarm rolled up to the students. Besides, there's going to be several Sector 7 agents at the dig site, so if there's a Decepticon attack, you can always go with them. She then opened her doors, inviting them inside. So, come on, who's ready to go on an adventure through the ancient world? A collective cheer rang through the whole base as the teens practically rushed toward their respective guardian Autobot. Though before she climbed into Bulkhead's passenger seat once again, a certain thought occurred to Mina. Her eyes drifted back to the mural on the hollow screen and before long, she had an epiphany. A.H. That's it. Bulkhead's holoform perked his head up at her shout. Hem. What's. It. Mina. Bulk. I think I've got the perfect idea for my hero history report. Mina buckled herself in as she explained. You know how Yaomomo and the boys talked about those being the Greek gods in that painting. Well, the gods also often had offspring who went on to be famous heroes. So, what I'm thinking is that I could do a report on how the ancient Greek heroes continue to influence our modern hero society today even after thousands of years. Hmm, now that's not a bad idea at all, Mina. Bulkhead approved. And the best part is that I'm betting no one else thought about it in our class. Mina rubbed her hands together eagerly. Since ancient Greek stuff is all pre-quirk, no one's going to focus nearly as much on that subject. I've gotta get Yaomomo and talk this over with her ASAP. Once everyone was ready, the Autobots all lined themselves up on the platform, with Optimus and Windblade standing up front. The city speaker transformed into her jet mode, hovering in mid-air as she awaited the command. 
Ready when you are, Optimus. The Prime nodded and started forward, raising his arm with his signature rallying cry. Autobots, roll out. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. Optimus transformed into his truck mode and went through the portal first, followed closely by Windblade and the other Autobots in one of the strangest convoys anyone ever did see. And, within a few short seconds, the vortex opened up for them on the other side, allowing them to emerge in what appeared to be some sort of massive quarry. Of course, it wasn't just any quarry, but a huge dig site with people working hard to unearth the ruins that were at the very center of it. Thankfully, all of the vehicles were black and had the signature, S7 inches logo on the side, so they knew that these weren't just normal everyday people at work. And that was none more apparent than who ended up meeting them the moment they came out of the ground bridge. Not too far away, a pair of small, black buggies came driving up to them, with Agent Fowler riding in one while Agent Burns rode in one of his own. Fowler stepped off his first and strolled over to the group. Prime, glad you all could make it, he then spotted all of the teens riding in the other Autobots as well. Quote dot dot dot, though I see you brought along some unexpected tag-alongs. I felt that the children should be allowed to see this, Agent Fowler. Optimus elaborated. After all, they're just as much a part of this as we are. And of course, with your people here, I trust that they'll be in safe hands. Hmm, well, I can't fault that logic, I suppose. Fowler admitted before spreading his arms out. In any case, welcome to the big dig. I'm guessing you got our message of both our big finds, so what do you want to see first? Well, Agent Fowler, I actually thought it best to have our team split off into two groups to investigate both points of interest. Prime continued before performing a turn toward the rest of his Autobots. Jazz, RC, Bumblebee and Strongarm, you all will follow me and we'll be investigating the ground bridge's origin point. Meanwhile, Bulkhead, you will be taking the others to find out the mysteries behind that mural. Strongarm audibly sighed in relief. Oh, thank Primus, I'm not in the same group as Sideswipe. The red Lamborghini groaned at that. Oh, come off it, will ya? With his engine vrooming, Sideswipe moved right over toward Agent Burns. Yo, Burns, ya mind showing us the way to the painting? The sooner I get away from Strongarm's nagging, the better. Sure thing. Burns nodded. Just be sure that everyone's in their designated groups before we ship out. After hearing that, Momo's head perked up and she opened up Arcee's door, leaving May in the back seat. She looked to Arcee's holoform with an apologetic smile. Sorry, Arcee, but if it's all the same to you, I'd actually like to check out that mural. Not every day you get to see a genuine piece of history just recently unearthed, you know. Oh, of course. Arcee grinned back. Go on ahead, I've got no problem with you wanting to see something that's significant to Earth history. Thanks, I'll see you guys later. Momo waved to RC and her group as she made her way over to Bulkheads, sliding into the large Hummer's backseat with Mina. And much to the pink girl's surprise, the moment Momo got in, she suddenly became very excited, her eyes and face practically lighting up. Ready to see something that no one else has in thousands of years, Mina. Hee hee hee, I can't wait. Mina blinked, still trying to process the other girl's astonishingly happy mood. Oh oh, yeah, of course. You must know a lot about Greek stuff, Yaomomo. Oh, it's one of my favorite places in the world. I'm sure, say, do you think you could help me out with something? It's actually sort of Greek related. Without warning, Momo got right up into Mina's face, more excited than ever. Oh my goodness, yes. Whatever you need help on, I'm more than happy to assist. So, what's on your mind? Mina broke out into a nervous sweat as she began tapping her fingers together. Hee hee, well. Comma dot dot. Several minutes had passed since the Autobots had split up, and Prime's group was already making leeway toward their destination. Granted, it wasn't exactly the smoothest of rides since they were going through a rather bumpy and claustrophobic tunnel, but they were still getting ever closer. Izuku and Kyoka had to brace themselves in Bumblebee's seats as they rumbled along while Tenya and Ochako had a relatively smoother ride inside of Strongarm, though Ochako herself was still shaking slightly. W what if there's some sort of cave-in and we get stuck? The brunette worried as she began fiddling with her hair. Oh or what if the tunnel actually collapses onto us, or... Ochako. 
Strong arm interrupted, bringing the gravity user out of her headspace. Do you happen to have a fear of closed spaces? Ah, uh, hee hee, maybe a slight phobia. Ochako emphasized, let's just say that a pantry with a magnetic lock isn't the best place to play hide and seek as a kid. Tenya glanced over to her, keeping a hold of the handle above Strongarm's door. That sounds awful, Uraraka. I'm sorry that had to happen. A small tinge of pink came to Ochako's cheeks, embarrassment beginning to take hold. Ah, it's really nothing major. I'm way over my fear, at least when it comes to cupboards. Her brown eyes trailed upward toward the tunnel's ceiling, focusing in on the stalactites that were pointed down toward them. Now, massive caves that could fall on top of us. Completely different. Well, don't worry. Strongarm assured. If anything happens, Red Alert can just get us out with the space bridge. Remember, it can home in on us anywhere on this planet, so take heart in that, okay. Ochako took in a deep breath, resolving herself with a small bit of confidence. Oh okay, that actually does make me feel a little better. She smiled and placed her hand on the dashboard. Thanks for the pep talk, Strongarm. Anytime. Not long after that, though, the tunnel began to widen before opening up all the way into the mouth of an absolutely enormous cavern, one that had an underground river running through it. What's more, they could see tiny, glowing blue crystals sticking out of random places on the walls, and Strongarm knew exactly what they were. Hey, do you guys see what I see? Yes, more Energon. Tenya adjusted his glasses to try and see it better. Although, this doesn't seem to be as big of a deposit as the one we found the other day. Actually, you might want to take another look. Strongarm came to a stop, as did everyone else, opening her doors for her passengers to disembark. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. Once they were out, she and the other Autobots all transformed, with the cadet moving over toward what seemed to be a huge stalagmite. See this. Izuku, Kyoka and Mei joined Ochako and Tenya to get closer to the massive rock, only to see that it wasn't what they had initially thought it was. In reality, this, stalagmite, was actually a huge, grey crystal, one that had absolutely no light to it whatsoever. But given what all of the other crystals in this cavern were, it stood to reason that this had to be, as that, Energon. Izuku asked. It looks, dead. Kyoka noted. Indeed. Optimus confirmed, walking over to the dull crystal. It stands to reason that this only reinforces my theory, that whoever left the space bridge here must have used the Energon Harvester to power it, draining the Energon in this cave system in order to do so. Tenya crossed his arms and raised a single brow. Well, that theory definitely holds water, but I do wonder, if there were Cybertronians on this planet in ancient times, then where exactly did they go? That's a question we still need to find the answer to. Jazz interjected, taking a few steps further into the cavern. And, the best way to find those answers is to start investigating. Yo, Fowler. You said that this place was where your people found the ground bridge, so you think you can give us a good idea of where it was. Fowler came over and ushered the others to follow him. More than that, Jazz, I can show you exactly where it used to be. Come on, this way. The Autobots and UA. Students all followed after Fowler, going a fair distance into the huge cave system before coming across a certain spot which immediately intrigued the entire team. It appeared to be a big, spacious indent in the cave's solid rock floor, one that was vaguely angular and just so happened to be the exact length and width of the ground bridge platform. And if that weren't enough, there was a hole in the wall that ended abruptly after about three yards. No doubt it was where the ground bridge's tunnel used to reside. Well, how do you like that for a find? Fowler smirked. Jazz whistled as he walked over to the large tunnel, tracing his fingers across its outer edge. Yep, definitely screams, ground bridge setup. He nodded over to Prime, who was also inspecting the visible ridges in the ground. So what now, Op? Doesn't seem to be much else here. Hum, Optimus hummed in contemplation before making his decision. I believe there's much more to this place than what we're seeing. Jazz, run a search on your sonic radar. You got it. Step back everyone, I need my space foe, this. The rest of the Autobots and humans stepped away from the lieutenant before he suddenly leapt up straight into the air, taking some of them by surprise. Woo. Let's drop the beat. He flipped in the air and came down in a hard stomp, 
which let loose a huge sonic pulse from his foot that reverberated through the floor, spreading out to the entire cavern. Whoa! Ochako recoiled, making sure that she was close to Strongarm as the ground shook. What was that? RC moved her optics down and gave a smile to the brunette. Don't worry, Ochako. That's just how Jazz activates his radar. She pointed over to Jazz, who is now looking at a holographic radar on his arm. It allows him to find things that might not be so obvious in the area. Jazz paced back and forth as his radar did its thing, before ultimately stopping in front of a big wall, that just so happened to be covered in massive boulders and other debris. Hey, well what you know. He did an about face and jerked his thumb back toward the huge stones. I'm detecting another hollow space behind this wall here, Prime. Seems to me there must have been a cave in that separated that room from the rest of the place. Excellent work, Jazz. Optimus nodded in approval. All right, Autobots, let's get this wall taken care of. Before any of the humans knew it, the Autobots all began to work on removing the massive boulder wall, with some even breaking out their weapons to batter against the boulders and loosen them up. Prime used his axe while Bumblebee and RC used their stingers and swords respectively, while Jazz and Strongarm relied on their fists and feet to do the talking. Man, they're going at it pretty hard, don't ya think? Izuku asked. Well, I can hardly blame them. Tenya shrugged. This is quite the lead, you know. Before long, the Autobots had successfully cleared the massive wall, in that the rubble had gotten so loose that it managed to finally give way. Ah. Everyone, get back, RC shouted, prompting everyone to clear the way as the boulders came tumbling down. The Autobots all covered the humans as the mini avalanche went on, though it thankfully stopped mere moments later. Is everyone alright? Yeah, pretty sure, Kyoka said before peering toward where the wall had once been, and her eyes widened considerably. Ah, uh, you guys might want to look at that. Everyone craned their heads back around, and were astonished by what they saw. It was a hidden alcove, which housed the remains of what had to be a small, desolated Cybertronian base. The large monitor up above the main console was cracked and there were several tools and trinkets strewn about the place, though what everyone noticed was that, there was something sitting in the main control chair. Ah, what's that? Ochako whispered nervously. Optimus narrowed his optics and strode forward, taking point as the other Autobots and humans followed slowly behind. The Prime reached out and spun the chair around, revealing a dead Cybertronian body. Ah! The teens shouted as Agent Fowler gasped. W who the heck is that? May screamed. At ease, everyone. Prime said with a raise of his hand. This bot has long since passed. The Autobot commander reached out and placed his hand on the bot's helm, taking note of the rust that had gathered. Poor soul must have been the one stationed here. Who knows how long he's been, wait. Optimus peered lower and saw that there was a massive wound in his stomach, and it was then that the cause of death became evident. He fell in the line of duty. Izuku, Kyoka and Ochako all gasped, the latter covering her mouth in shock. W what? How? Yeah, I mean, there doesn't seem to be any signs of a struggle. Izuku added. The Prime shook his head. I'm not too sure, Izuku. It is quite puzzling. Well, eyes, quite the find, I'll say that much. Fowler shrugged. So, what now? Optimus craned his head over toward the console, putting his hand on it to test the buttons. Hmm, Bumblebee, I need your assistance. The little yellow bot was surprised by the order, but nonetheless went straight over to Optimus. I need you to give these systems a jumpstart with your stingers. With any luck, they may still have enough energon to run for at least a few cycles. Bumblebee gave him a salute. ZRKT, you got it, boss man. The scout moved down onto his knees and took off some of the metal paneling on the console, locating the main power core. Bumblebee's hands then folded in and were exchanged for his stingers before plugging them into the core, and it wasn't long before the others could hear the sound of the device charging right up. Aha! Incredible! May exclaimed, lacing her fingers together. It's amazing just how long Cybertronian tech can last. The Prime nodded down to his friend. Good work, Bumblebee. Now, let's see if we can't find any evidence as to who this bot was. With the screen glowing brightly, Optimus typed in a command, hoping to find any sort of log files. It wasn't long before he spotted something interesting, and sure enough, the moment he opened the file, it was what he was looking for. Though at the same time, it wasn't a pretty sight. 
The moment the video began, they saw the now dead bot struggling to even speak, let alone move with the gaping wound in his midsection. He was confined to his chair in the exact position he was sitting in, and it was clear that these had to have been his final moments. Ow, ah, uh, padlock's log. I I'm not going to give a date this time since, well, things aren't exactly going well, and I'm afraid there's not much time left for me. The bot focused his green optics straight into the camera, shaking his head sadly. We couldn't have foreseen this attack, the Decepticons finally found us on this planet. The Autobots all stared on in shock, with Arcee's hand going over her mouth to stifle a gasp. Strongarm pursed her lips while Jazz balled his hands into fists. Should have known. The lieutenant grumbled. They came at us from the sky, and, A and we were outnumbered 10 to 5. Padlock shook his head and smashed his fist against the console. Everyone, is gone. Wind dagger, camshaft, downshift, overdrive, all gone. Everyone could hear Padlock's voice crack and he held his face in his hands for a short while, trying to compose himself. The humans were left utterly speechless by what Padlock was saying, and it was then that the gravity of everything hit them all at once. Robots, who can get hurt. Tenya muttered. Robots who feel. Ochako whispered. Robots who can. Izuku swallowed hard as he forced out the last word, die. Padlock took a deep intake before pressing on. And, and I'm going to be joining them in the well of all sparks soon, too. After giving them a proper burial and disposing of the Decepticon filth, I've come to accept my fate. He suddenly began hacking and coughing up Energon, leaving the viewers all the more uneasy. Hack hack. Be but I can at least rest easy knowing that everything that we worked for is still here. My brothers didn't die in vain. While our search for the Ark has been unsuccessful, we still protected the ground bridge just as we promised. In this, Padlock pulled up a small data disk and a much larger pylon-shaped device, holding both shakily. These are still intact, waiting for the day their proper receiver will arrive. The bot leaned closer to the screen, placing the disk and the pylon into a storage container inside of the console. Optimus Prime. A chill went through the entire group, including Optimus himself. The Autobot leader leaned in closer to the screen, intently listening as Padlock continued. I hope that one day you will be able to find this. What I'm storing away for you is a special message and data that could give the Autobots an advantage to win the war. But these also must not fall into Decepticon hands, so, the green-eyed Autobot pulled out his firearm and aimed it at the top of the entryway. I'm going to seal myself in here just to make sure it's hidden. The ground bridge may be found, but this data is far more important. Padlock's optics began to flicker as his finger pulled on the trigger. Please Optimus, if you ever find this, for the sake of all of Cybertron, keep this secret safe. With that, Padlock pulled the trigger and caused a massive cave in, slumping over in his chair as the boulders sealed him into the alcove. And with that, the message cut to static, leaving everyone with a hollow, harrowing feeling. By God. Fowler lowered his head. Poor soldier took a secret to the grave with him. He did, and I commend him for his bravery in the face of overwhelming odds. Optimus reached over and placed a hand on the fallen Autobot's shoulder. Thank you, Padlock. The sacrifice that you and your team made will not be in vain. So, wait, that means that there were other Autobots here on Earth before Bumblebee got here. Kyoka deduced. If that's the case then, who sent them? I'm unsure of that myself, Kyoka. Optimus admitted before reaching for the exact spot that Padlock had hidden the valuables. He opened the compartment up and retrieved the data disk and the pylon-shaped device, holding it securely in his hands. But I believe that these will give the answers that we need. Prime craned his head down to Fowler. Special Agent Fowler, I require a trailer to take Padlock's body back to the base. We will be sure to give him a proper hero's funeral. The agent nodded wholeheartedly. Of course, Prime, will do. He turned around and pulled out a walkie-talkie from his pocket. This is Fowler, I need a flatbed down here, on the double. Izuku walked up to Optimus, eyeing the two objects in his hands closely. So, what do you think those are, Optimus? Once again, Izuku, I am uncertain. Optimus said with a shake of his head. It could be a number of things, but the only way to find out is to get back to base. Autobots, once we get Padlock out of here, we'll regroup with the others. Let's hope that their excursion isn't as harrowing as our own. Comma dot dot. 
So you mean to tell me that you forgot your history report? Mina shrunk back under Momo's scrutinizing gaze, twiddling her fingers sheepishly. Hee <laughs> hee, w well, forgot, is a strong word. I think a better way to word it is, erm, it just slipped my mind. Momo facepalmed and sighed. Mina, UA might be a school for heroes, but it's still high school. It's not going to be an easy breeze like how normal middle school was. She's got a point, Mina. Bulkhead piped up. If anything, being a hero school sounds like it's a lot harder. Gee, thanks for the reminder, Bulk. Mina's voice dripped with sarcasm as she shook her head. And Yao Momo, I get it, I honestly do, it's just that the stuff that they expect us all to learn is so hard. The pink girl saw her friend's eyebrow move up. I mean for me, of course, it'd be a cinch for you. You got in on recommendations after all. Momo coughed into her hand at that. Ahem, I will admit that my prior education was on a bit of a higher level, but that shouldn't be an excuse for why you aren't doing the material. She reached over and grasped Mina's shoulders. Mina, I'm going to help you, but I expect you to take all of this 100% serious. No shirking on the work, no distractions, nothing of that sort will be tolerated in this three-day crunch, okay. Okay. Mina nodded, putting on a serious face. I'll make sure to give it my all, even if my brain hurts by the end. Just keep reminding yourself, a little mind-numbing curriculum is better than getting a flunking grade. Momo gave her a smile and pat Mina on the shoulder. Besides, you've chosen a fun topic to write your paper on, so I'm sure you'll get through it. Mina gave her a thumbs up. Oh, you know it. So, where do we start? We start right now. Bulkhead interjected again before coming to a halt, opening his doors for the girls. Time to unload, ladies. We're here. A gasp escaped Momo's throat before she grabbed hold of Mina's wrist. Come on, let's go. Mina yipped as she was dragged out by Momo, the two girls being met by Ajiro and Denki soon after. The area was practically littered with Greek pillars, some intact, though they were mostly destroyed. Windblade soon came down for a landing and transformed, followed by the Lambo twins and of course, Bulkhead. Agent Burns then pulled to a stop in his buggy, only to be intercepted by Momo. Okay, so where's the mural? I've been dying to see it. Hee <laughs> hee, okay, hold your horses. Burns chuckled as he pointed over to a nearby ridge. The mural's down there, right in the center of that ancient atrium we dug up. The Energon should be down there as well. Excellent. Windblade nodded. Let's check this out. With that, everyone made their way over to the ridge, seeing that it was indeed the top of a set of seats that formed a semicircular atrium. Whoa, now this is awesome. Ajiro commented, reached down to brush his hand against the ancient stone. Can you believe that people used to sit on these things? It's crazy. Denki shrugged his shoulders. Yeah, I guess it's neat, I suppose. Though honestly, I'd rather not think of big assemblies. Reminds me too much of school. Ajiro and Momo couldn't help but roll their eyes as Denki's attention went straight for the opposite side of the place. But ya know what does get me going? That. Everyone's eyes went up and they gasped at the sight. The mural was much bigger than expected, being about 30 feet in length and 10 feet in height. Momo could feel her jaw drop at the sight of all the Greek gods represented on the stone slab, and her lips quickly turned up into a huge grin. Eeeeee. This is so amazing. Come on, let's get a closer look. The humans and Autobots carefully followed Momo down the steps, though before she got within 20 feet of the mural, Agent Burns rushed up and stopped her. Whoa, whoa, let's not get too hasty, Miss Yaoyorozu. Remember, this is a dig site, and that mural is still an ancient artifact. We gotta be careful not to damage it in any way, agreed. Oh, yes, absolutely. Momo nodded. I'll be sure to keep my distance. Sideswipe and Sunstreaker stopped as well and used their optics to zoom in on the painting, taking note of the craftsmanship. Woo, man, and here I thought Cybertron had some crazy ancient stuff. These people used stone for this kind of stuff. Sideswipe commented. Well, obviously. Sunstreaker shoved his brother lightly. Organic planets are kinda like that, bro. Sideswipe instantly went to push back, but was stopped by Windblade. Okay, okay, let's not get riled up here boys. Remember, we've got a job to do. She pointed up to the mural, specifically to the Energon Harvester in Zeus, hands. Now, let's get to work finding that artifact. 
Oh, I am afraid Zot will not be possible, Fraulian. Everyone froze in place as they heard the sound of an engine come to life. And what's more, it came from behind the mural. The group took several steps back after seeing a black and silver hearse come rolling out from behind the stone slab, pulling around into a halt before. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. The vinyl top of the hearse suddenly came quite loose before falling limply against the vehicle, whose back section extended outward to form a pair of legs. The doors of the vehicle unfurled and became armor on the robot's arms while the front wheels became its shoulders. As more panels separated, several unseen red details became more prominent on the robot, with four sets of guns emerging from his shoulders as the hood folded down and became the robot's chest. Finally, the robot's faceplated head came out, his piercing red eyes landing directly on the Autobots while the vinyl cape on his hips flowed in the wind. Guten Tag, Autobots. Fine day we're having, is it not? The four Autobots were astonished by who was standing before them. Flatline. Windblade took out her Stormfall sword while the other bots prepared their firearms. What are you doing here? Okay, I give, who the heck is he? Ajiro asked as Burns backed the teens up to a safe distance. He's the Decepticon's main medical officer. Sideswipe elaborated. And also purveyor of bad mojo. HMPH, Vel, that isn't exactly how I voldvort it. Flatline placed his hands behind his back with a small bow of his head. I prefer to think of myself as a medic who uses unconventional thinking to heal the injured. Sunstreaker narrowed his optics at him. Yeah, by experimenting on him like lab rats. I'd say you're crazy, but at least you're not as bad as Shockwave. I will take that as a compliment, my good chap. The Decepticon medic shook his head disappointedly. But alas, I spoke the truth when I said that you will not find the Energon Harvester here. Mein Freund and I arrived several cycles ago and searched everywhere around here. And nothing. Nothing here even remotely resembled the Harvester. Bulkhead furrowed his metal brow at Flatline suspiciously. Wait, who's this friend of yours? If that isn't million credit question. The humans all yelped at the sound of the big, booming Russian voice while the Autobots all felt a chill go through their systems. All except Bulkhead. He kept his glowering face on him as he and the others turned around to see an absolutely massive Decepticon, one who had to be even bigger than Optimus, or even Starscream. He had a green and blue color scheme and had rather wide shoulders, with huge legs that had treads wrapped up in them. His helmet was dome-shaped and had a pair of sharp, curved horns sticking out the front, and he had a pair of cannons sticking up out of his back behind his head. Bulkhead sneered as the con's name escaped his mouth. Blastwave. His red optics focused down onto Bulkhead with a jovial grin. Ah ha ha. Bulkhead. It has been very, very long time. Not long enough if you ask me. Blastwave smirked at that. Ah, did you not miss your old wrecking friend? Like rust in my undercarriage. Bulkhead snapped back. Mina eyed up to Bulkhead with a raised brow. You know that bruiser. The big green Autobot glanced down to her with a distasted face. Unfortunately. We have a history. And you have new pets. Tell me, Blastwave reached over and practically yanked a pillar out of the ground, hefting it up over his head with ease. Do they play, catch? With all his might, Blastwave threw the pillar at the humans, and while Ejiro hardened himself up to intercept the projectile, Bulkhead got to it first, punching it right out of the air. Everyone, get back. Bulkhead aimed his arm cannon at Blastwave and began shooting at him, though the bruiser simply charged forward nonetheless while aiming his shoulder cannons down to fire back. The Autobots scattered while Burns led the children off to the side, all as Bulkhead and Blastwave charged directly at one another. Bam! The two slammed right into each other and began grappling, with neither one letting up. You are K, you think I'm just gonna let you hurt my friends, Blastwave. Like how you did to everyone else back then. Ah, those were good old days. But remembering those days gives Blastwave processor ache, so he's just going to kill you now. Blastwave socked Bulkhead right in the gut, and to everyone's surprise, he lifted the rotund Autobot over his head as easily as he did to that pillar. He faced the mural and grinned wildly in delight. Now I shall crush you, coward. Momo's eyes widened in horror. No. Someone stop him before he wrecks that priceless artifact. Fortunately, her cries didn't fall on deaf ears, 
though the one who did stop Blastwave was the last person she had expected. Blastwave, no, stop. Flatline rushed in front of the Decepticon munitions expert with his hands raised, making Blastwave pause. Wait just one moment, if you vold. Flatline did an about face and used his optics to take a picture of the mural, specifically of Zeus holding the Energon Harvester before he nodded back to Blastwave as he slipped away. Alright, you're good. Proceed with Z smashing. Blastwave threw his head back and laughed. Ahahaha. Gladly. Oh no, ya don't, big guy. Before he could react, Sideswipe and Sunstreaker came hurtling in on either side of Blastwave, with the Red Brother going for his legs on one side while Sunstreaker toppled his upper half on the other. All four bots ended up collapsed on the ground, but on the upside, this allowed Bulkhead to escape. Ah, thanks fellas. Bulkhead brought out his mace and rushed toward Blastwave, dealing a swift uppercut to the bruiser to send him sprawling back even further. Windblade got in on the action as well, going after Flatline with her sword. The doctor responded by bringing out a concealed arm blade and parrying her strikes with his own, the two clashing multiple times a minute. Gah, you know, Flatline, I'm surprised at you. Maybe if you had kept on the straight and narrow, you'd still be a respected medic in the elite guard back on Cybertron. Flatline merely scoffed at that. Bah, Joe's Schweinhunds never recognized my genius. I could have made revolutionary discoveries that could turn mechs into gods if G had just allowed me to perform my experiments in peace. You mean your unethical, inhumane experiments that involved taking bots apart and putting them back together. Windblade snapped back. Yeah, can't imagine why they denied you. HMPH, genius is never appreciated in its time. But enough of ZHIS already. Flatline pulled his other hand into his arm and out came a large chainsaw weapon that had red energy blades in it, which he quickly activated and swiped at Windblade's open spot. The city speaker managed to get out of the way, only to be kneed right in the gut by Flatline, which he followed up by tossing her into a nearby stone wall. He reached up to his calm and spoke, Jesus Flatline, they have what they came for. Open Z space bridge now. Not too far from where Bulkhead and Blastwave were fighting, said space bridge opened up, taking Bulkhead off guard. Huh, what the, bam, ow. With a strong right hook from Blastwave, Bulkhead was sent stumbling to the ground again, the Decepticon laughing at his enemy's misfortune. Ahahaha, you were beaten, not big surprise. He saw Flatline approaching him and smiled eagerly. Come doctor, let us finish them off. No need, mind froing. Flatline denied. They got what they needed, after all. He faced the Autobots and gave them one last wave. Auf Wiedersehen, Dumkoffs. It has been fun, but I'm afraid they have to say farewell. Blastwave, leave them with one last parting gift, Vold you. Ahaha, ha. of course. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. Before anyone knew it, Blastwave had transformed into an absolutely huge tank his arms forming the main turret while his cannons moved to become its twin barrels. His main body became the very center of the tank, with his chest forming some sort of huge cow catcher on the front while his legs unfolded and unfurled to form the treads on either side. Blastwave took aim at the Autobots and hollered, Die, cowards! Before firing off two massive shells at them, causing a big explosion that sent the Autobots flying back. Sideswipe. Sunstreaker. Ajiro and Denki shouted as the dust started to settle, the two rushing over to their guardians. Windblade. Momo sprinted over to the city speaker, putting her hand to her cheek. A are you alright? Speak to me. Ah, that was not pleasant. Windblade muttered as the Lambo twins began to stir as well. W wears Blastwave and Flatline. Momo craned her head around, but could see no sign of either Decepticon or the space bridge. She let out a sigh and her shoulders slumped. They're gone. Bulkhead. Mina screamed as she also ran toward her own guardian, the green Autobot actually managing to sit up. Her expression was angry, but also full of determination. Ah, I couldn't stand those two. They made us all look like dummies. With a groan, Bulkhead rubbed his head against his helm in frustration. How do ya think I feel? His optics went over to where the space bridge had once been, glaring as his fist shook with anger. But I'll tell you this, this ain't over, not by a long shot. Well, look on the bright side. It could have been worse, right? 
Sideswipe stood up and went over to the mural, patting his hand on the stone slab. After all, the pretty painting's all nice and intact, crack. The young Autobot snapped his optics wide open and they shot down, to see that he had accidentally chipped off a whole corner of the priceless ancient artifact. And within moments, he felt several glares directed straight to him. Momo in particular appeared to be extremely livid. Uh, he he, Sideswipe gently set the corner piece on top of the slab and stepped away from it post haste. I'll shut up now. And it's the end of season 2 part 5 of this what if, I hope you guys like it, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment down below and subscribe to the channel.